tonight again we're looking at revelation 14 3 to 5 followers of the lamb what are the characteristics of those who follow and worship and uh are uh, the people of god very interesting all of us should take note and pay close attention so let's let's read again the scripture it's always good even though we did read this last week we're commenting on uh this week we're going to be looking at uh some of the texts we looked at last week but going deeper and so let's read three to five in chapter 14. and they sung it as it were a new song well, forgive me let's start with the greek Κι ού και βρέθη ψεύδος εν το στόμα τη αυτόν, άμω μη γάρεσιν. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Uh, this is the Orthodox New Testament version. We're not going to uh, read that. We went over that last week. Uh, but for those who are joining us just now, did not hear last week's uh, lesson where we covered the examination of the meaning here of not being defiled with women and for they are virgins. I think some people can easily misunderstand that. They need to go back to last week's lesson. Or if you have the five volume series of Elder Athanasius, look at uh, the lecture that covers this, this scripture, uh, this, these passages. Uh, and it's not a, um, uh, it's not to be understood wrongly that it's a disdain of marriage. Uh, but I'm not going to go through that again tonight. Go back and look at it last week, and there'll be a thorough ex explanation of all that. So these are the ones following the Lamb wheresoever he may go. And this is where the elder wants us to pay special attention. Uh, what is this telling us? What is the characteristic of those who are so dedicated? So first of all, we see characteristics of virginity or purity, which we read about, but also this total dedication and commitment. This is the state of total dedication and commitment, which is characterized by steadfast faith in following Christ at the point of death and the imitation of the Lamb. So we have dedication until the last breath and imitation of the Lamb within this phrase these are the ones following the lamb wheresoever he may go so uh it's something that we see quite often in all of our uh examinations of contemporary issues that are challenges of the church one of the things we see what following the holy fathers which is not at all uh different than following the lamb because these are the servants of the Lamb. These are the throne around the throne of, of the of the Lamb. These are the ones who uh, show forth Christ in themselves, not I, but Christ lives in me. So this following, this dedication, this discipleship uh, is foundational in having the identity of Christ, being a disciple of Christ. Uh, what it means to be in the Church of Christ. Uh, it's the first fruits. Offering for God from the redemptive sacrifice of Christ. Not the last fruits, as we'll talk about tonight, but the first fruits, the best, the best of, a, of what we can offer. It entails the devotion of one's entire existence, soul, and body 
in the consecration or the commitment of oneself to God. I consecrate myself means I purify, I sanctify, I cleanse myself. Of course, this does not mean wrongly interpreted that we can cleanse and purify ourselves or sanctify ourselves, but we commit ourselves to the purification, sanctification uh, that is given by God. We open ourselves up, we say yes to God, but it's a shorthand for uh, dedicating ourselves, being commitment committed to this. And I put to, to death my selfish desires and my egotism or ego egoism. Uh, so this is a little bit first steps in understanding what it means to follow the lamb wheresoever he will go. The apostle Paul gives us a little more insight. It is no longer I, he says, who live, but Christ who lives in me or who liveth in me in the King James. Always Carrying in my body, he says elsewhere in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, always carrying in my body the death of Jesus. So the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Uh, and Clement of Alexander, talking about this, says the following, the flesh has died for this person, the person who is following the lamb, the person who is Christ living in, in him. The flesh has died, and he only lives to dedicate his tomb, which is, his body, since he is dead to the world, to be a holy temple of the Lord. So the here the death of this person, of course, is not physical death, but the death to the fleshly passions, to the old man, to the fallen man, to the contrary man, to the proud, arrogant, uh, lustful man. This is the death that he dies and then lives, as the apostle says, unto Christ. Uh, so this is something that the elder says, I entreat you always to keep this in mind. Always to keep this in mind, the mortification, even about lawful things, going back here, uh, that this death is not just to the unlawful, that's understood, but even to the lawful things. We see this in the ascetic life. Uh, we forego foods which are perfectly good foods. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not, they're not eat by eating them. We're not necessarily sinning, but we forego them for the sake of and for the love of Christ. So something that's lawful, even these things are put aside or relations within uh, with within marriage or to, to be married to begin with for the monastics. They forego these things which are lawful so that we will not become scandalized when we witness someone who chooses the path, remember this, for, this mortification, how essential it is, so that you and I are not scandalized when we see someone choose the path, let's say of monasticism, the path of total dedication. This is not something that's all that rare. I remember 30 years ago when I just had become Orthodox, there was a very a good friend who chose the monastic life. It was sudden. Of course, he had been working within this, this friend quite some time, but for all of us, it was sudden and it was new and it was painful to have someone who you were friends with to depart suddenly from amongst you and go. Uh, but it was extremely edifying, if, if also painful. But it's easy for people, especially mothers and fathers, to be scandalized when their children want to go the path of total dedication to Christ. So remember that this is at the heart of all of our lives as Orthodox Christians. It's not just for monastics. This is a major delusion that you find among some Orthodox Christians today is that they say, well, that's for the monastics. We hear this a lot. Oh, that's for that, that, that's too strict for us. We don't fast from oil on Wednesday and Friday. That's for the monastics, for instance, maybe. Just give an example. Uh, you know, or, uh, or these services, these must be much shorter because that's for monastics. Now, it in and of itself, the time is not the question. It's the question of the perception of things, that things can be, that the life in Christ, the, 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 the total dedication, the mortification of the desires, the, the passions. Like Someone wrote me a couple of days, and was, I think it was in reference to this last, uh, one of these clips that we put on, and said, it seems like you're implying that sitting and watching a football game on Sunday is like you know sinful or something and so if we if we don't understand that even the lawful things are given up even the things that you say well in and of itself uh, maybe there's no sin you know positive like action of sin right but but 
But the, the total dedication that God wants for his disciples, the 144,000, those followers of the Lamb, those who love him with all their heart, soul, and mind, there are many things that are in this world, on one level for the world, certainly attractive and even you know considered good. On the level of, let's say, pastoral economia, many things happen because we're not there. We don't have the struggle. We don't want it. And then there's also even things that are lawful, but we but we're called to give those up as well. And so that can't be imposed. Whoever desires to be my disciple, come after me, he says. But when it's chosen or when it's praised or when it's pointed to as a goal, there are people who recoil. And they recoil because they've not been perhaps catechized properly. They've not been they have not been given the examples. They've not heard from great elders, elder of Themios or elder. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Athanasios. So, um, but this is this is at the core of the whole life of all those who are followers of Christ, followers of the Lamb, this mortification. So don't be scandalized when someone says, an elder, a priest, a fellow Christian, let's give up that, even though it's lawful. Now, there's a great amount of discernment that needs to be at play especially for parents, for their children, or spiritual fathers for their spiritual children, or bishops for their clergy, their flock. Obviously, there's going to be a great amount of discernment. Pedagogy, it's a great art. It's an art of pedagogy, art of spiritual initiation, initiation where, how, when where the challenge is going to be set, or the, the push for a, a greater and total dedication there. I mean, there are many who are falling away on the right, who are totally undiscerning, who push a total mortification on others instead of first and foremost on themselves and so there's a lot of pitfalls here but for our purposes right this minute let's just establish that in fact this mortification this deadening of the fleshly desires of the worldly pursuits and a total dedication is what's being described here in the book of revelation and is praised and and these these special ones let's say are the ones at the throne right we talked about last week that these are referring to the virgins the monastics the the others who are virgins in purity and soul etc those who are totally and 100 percent dedicated this is describing a particular group within the church it's a general number not a specific number we talked all about this last week so we won't repeat it tonight but these are praised and glorified in the book of Revelation, not seen as, oh, exceptions that don't apply or are not for us uh, examples. So this dedication consists of a general mortification. When we say mortification, it's a, basically a term we shouldn't go, I mean, we have people coming from Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Papal Protestant, or Reformed Protestant backgrounds, and maybe they're seeing words like mortification, I don't know, and they're they're loaded. This is simply a deadening of the fleshly and worldly desires, right? So that's a that's a basic ascetical endeavor and stance of the Orthodox Christian. That this is not only again for unlawful things, but even for those things um, which are lawful, but certainly for fornication, greed, theft, seeking wealth uh, for his own sake, just to get rich, greed. Uh, whatever else, right? These things obviously are going to be, a, the dedicated ones are going to do this. But then also there's lawful things and permissible things which the dedicated will be dead to. Uh, and this is where in earnest the ascetic life begins, uh, the, the, the struggle for perfection, for the uh, going higher, going deeper as you like. So there, there is in scripture, of course, examples of this self-denial, this dedication. And what does the Lord say? He says, and again, these are natural relations that he's saying that we have to put in the hierarchy of things. That first is first is this, first is God, first is uh, our love of God, and then comes the love of other men, other women, mother, father. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So these are basic, basic um, 
basic teachings for us to understand the hierarchy. And there are times, as you'll see, when these things can seemingly come into contradiction. Right? They, they appear to be in contradiction, but we'll see the hierarchy and, and very easily uh, be able to determine uh, where uh, we're going to, how we're going to navigate that. But there are people who have difficulty navigating that in their families. So there's a hierarchy of the commandments. Honor your father and mother is another commandment of our Lord, of course. Is that now set aside? We don't honor our father and mother anymore? No. That is indeed a commandment. But when the two are at odds, when there's a conflict, there is a clear order of things. So first of all, we have to put first things first. And then remember the order of things, the commandments, the Ten Commandments. We had the first is to, the, to the, our dedication, our love, and our worship of God. And number five is the honoring of father and mother. And that commandment is going to have boundaries, going to have limits. The one who loves father and mother above me, and this, this relative love for parents goes beyond its boundaries, is not worthy of me. That's what he's saying there, the Lord is saying. You have this relative love, which now surpasses its boundaries in its place and covers over that ultimate total dedication that, that is, belongs to God. And that, when that is in practice and we follow after it, we're not worthy of God. So the one who loves God first and then his parents will always know how to truly love his parents. That's another side of this, that if you don't have the hierarchy correct, one and then two, three, four, five, then what happens is you don't know how to love God, of course, because you've you put things out of order, or your parents, because they, everything has to be in order. So the one who loves God first, all my whole soul and mind, heart, soul, and mind, right, gives all his love to God first and foremost, then he will understand how to honor truly and love his own parents. The one who loves his parents first and above God cannot truly love his parents. Cannot truly love his parents. So uh it is, it's not, it's, if you violate these, this order of things, you will lose both. That's, that's the message here. Um, and it's happens quite often. And the parents many times demand this of their children in a very undiscerning uh, and destructive way. And we see this many times, um, especially around the monastery where people, young people wanted to go, for instance, when Elder Ephraim came from America, I remember 25 years ago when these monasteries were just popping up in the 1990s all over the United States, and there were young men and women who were running to become monastics because they'd never had this opportunity or had not yet had this opportunity in their lives. They were young. They were in their 18, 19, 20, 21. There was a lot of conflict because it was it was this order of things had never, it was out of order, and there was no knowledge of the order of things, and so things were really quite out of sync and a lot of challenges to the status quo and all the rest. Uh, so the 144,000, those followers of the lambs, they have this, the proper hierarchy in things and they, they understand who they need to love first and foremost. And of course the parents who love God first and foremost will also see this and those parents will see this for their own children and in li likewise serve that higher uh, a goal and a hierarchy of the commandments. So he who does not sacrifice his existence to follow Christ, and what does that mean? One who fears for his life, refuses to suffer, these people, uses any method to save his own life during times of Christian persecution. These are the examples that the elder gives. Does not sacrifice his existence to follow Christ, but fears, refuses, looks at his own good. He's not worthy of Christ. He will lose his true and eternal life. This is exactly opposite the saints and the martyrs. So this fear is extremely destructive. We saw this fear during COVIDism. We see this fear all the time, even now, and probably we'll see a lot more of it in the near future. The fear of 
acceptance in the world, the fear of the governmental powers, the fear of the some maybe ecclesiastical powers who have lost their way and are teaching heresy. We fear what they can do to us. Maybe we can lose our job, lose our position, right? That inordinate fear, which dominates and and short circuits our sacrifice for Christ, and there's, because we've lost the hierarchy, right? Who do we obey first? Christ or a cleric who has gone astray and teaches heresy? This is a huge can of worms and a huge issue, but it will become, and it is already a major need in the church for proper understanding, proper catechism. The, the, the characteristic of the demonic methodology is always to present two bad choices and, and then say you have to choose one of these. And so the two bad choices in, the, in this case, we talked about mother and father in the hierarchy for someone who wants to, let's say a child wants to go become a monastic. What about in the church where we have a hierarchy Clearly, the hierarchy, it's not hard to understand, Christ, the bishops, the priests, the deacons, we have this very clear hierarchy, and obedience is key for salvation, absolutely essential for salvation, and if one is not obedient, he, he cannot make progress in spiritual life, he, he, he cannot unite himself to Christ. Ultimately, that hierarchy is given for our salvation so that we can unite ourselves to Christ, and when the hierarchy is properly ordered and everyone is playing their role, then it is indeed the church operates unto salvation but what happens when somewhere in that hierarchy patriarch bishop synod even synod patriarch bishop priest or even catechist or something like a you know academic theologian is teaching that which has never been taught or teaching that which has not been handed down or undermining the teachings that have been handed down what do we do then and there's a lot of examples of that today unfortunately what do we do we follow Christ, of course. It says right there in Acts, the apostles were standing before the Pharisees. They said they were commanded not to teach or preach Christ. And they said, we will obey God, not men. And this standard has been repeated again and again throughout history. When heresies have, have risen their head, we have great and wonderful saints who were confessors and martyrs precisely because they understood the hierarchy. They were not confused. And they refused to submit to those who had departed and no longer showed forth Christ. So if you have if you have a clergyman who is not showing forth Christ because he's teaching that which Christ never taught or the church had never handed down, or he's denying people to go deeper, to become initiated and all the rest, uh, then you have uh, you have not only the option but you really have the responsibility to to operate in a way that's going to be salvific, therapeutic, first and foremost for that person who's erred, our love of that person, that priest or bishop or whoever it might be, who's erred, we've left to love them first and foremost. All of this presupposes that we understand who Christ is and we're his disciples. All of that is why the catechism is so, so important. When somebody becomes an Orthodox Christian, the foundation of their whole life in Christ is laid there in the catechumenate. A bad catechumenate is going to spell disaster over time for that person, and if it's multiplied on many places and levels for the whole church. So it's not an absolute good to do mission and, and people to convert. It's not an absolute good if the catechism is not up to par, it's not proper, it's not orthodox. If people are coming in after reading two books and coming to church for a few weeks or months, and they've not changed their whole life, they've not become Christians in the fullest sense of the word, not become entirely initiated in the life of the church, except for those, those mysteries. In other words, the life, they're leading the life of an Orthodox Christian before baptism, all the stuff that we talk about here again and again and again, but so important. What's going to happen is they're going to start building on a foundation which is, which is not laid properly. It's not the foundation that it is meant for that person. And that will be multiplied again and again. And so we... We have to keep the hierarchy and understand the hierarchy. It's so, so important. Elder Athanasius has a whole homily on this and gives many examples of what happens when that proper hierarchy is not, is not understood. I'm talking about the hierarchy of obediences, the hierarchy of loves, not just the hierarchy of ordination, which should go together uh, with that. But um, we want to be worthy of Christ and not allow any of the 
that which is under that first love to tear us away, sometimes in the name of Christ. How many heresies and heretics have said, you must obey us or you will be lost? How many have broken away from the church and demanded total uh, obedience, otherwise you'll be lost? We see this right now as a huge confusion in the world, right? Uh, and each each sect and each heretical teaching is pushing itself as as legitimate, if not the uh, the church or the uh, correct expression of the church. All right, so let's move on, and because we can go on for quite some time on that. And we read again this uh, in this phrase, following the Lamb wherever he will go. We see. This other side of things is total commitment and dedication. And we see in other parts of the gospel, the Lord saying, uh, giving examples, for instance, Luke, uh, where he is calling them to be the, to come after him, to be the disciple, and they're making up excuses. Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. Uh, uh, you know, given in marriage or, or other excuses. He, he's very rich and he cannot give up his riches and all the rest. Uh, bury bury the dead, you know, the, I mean, go and bury my father. And the Lord says, let the dead bury their own dead. So again, not an understanding of the hierarchy of things. Uh, it is, of course, understandable, of course, on one level, that he will go and bury his father and then come. And yet the Lord says, let the dead bury their own dead. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, it means... Let those who are spiritually dead, the relatives who have no spiritual interests, bury the body of your dead father, and you come follow after me. This is something we see, at least in Greece, when I lived there for 20, 20 years, we saw a lot of. We have a whole country that's orthodox, and yet so many are ignorant, indifferent, secularized, and not living the spiritual life. And so many people in their early 20s, discover Christ anew, having grown up in these secularized households where people are orthodox, they go five times a year, 20 times a year, whatever it is, but they don't understand, they're not living the spiritual life, they don't go to confession, they don't have a spiritual father. And then these young people, we saw it again and again, and they, they come alive and they want to be Christians and they go to Mount Athos and they go to the monasteries and they have to choose, just like this person here, to let the dead bury the dead. In other words, the relatives who don't want, understand, aren't interested in being truly disciples of Christ, putting all those things aside, following the, the Lamb wherever He will go, they have to let the relatives, the spiritually dead relatives, go. And it's very difficult. It's painful, but it's essential. Not that they're going to spurn them or deny or disdain them, but they're not going to follow them any longer. They're not going to be, they're not going to be uh, following their way. They're not going to be making their way of uh, their worldliness their own, but they're going to live a totally different way, uh, the way of Christ. And so this follow me of the of the, uh, the Lord to the apostles is directed to every one of us. And we have to immediately, if we're going to make progress, immediately leave our father, the nets, the boats, like we saw with the apostles when they were called, and follow after him, whatever that is in your life whatever the nets or boat might be in your life, if you're going to be numbered among at least these 144,000. Again, a general number to, talking about uh, this segment of the saved, which is the virgins, the monastics. This is what we're talking about here. If thou will perfect, be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast talking about the total dedication necessary and characteristic of the followers. And give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But indeed, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. As we talked about, I think, I don't remember when now, it's, we have many lectures going on, but we talked about, I think, a week or two ago. This, These possessions are not just gold or money right there are many possessions which we hold on to as again the hierarchy is not proper here it's something he was attached to inordinately above and beyond what it what it deserved whatever it might be 
even family, even houses, even ideologies, even, even things that are intellectual. We could have intellectual commitment. I'm committed to this intellectual uh, outlook. I'm committed to this, uh, this school of thought. I'm committed to this movement. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Everything is, that's created and of the created world has to be second, and we have to give it away. And there are those who are very rich. There are those who are very rich. I, there are many examples like this. We have a few that I could mention where they are very rich in academia, for example. They're very well-known professors of history or theology. And they understand over time that orthodoxy, the Orthodox Church, is the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. And they have to depart from amongst the heterodox and become orthodox. But that would mean losing maybe their chair. It, literally, the, the chair that they, I mean, not the little chair, but the, the authority and the prestige they have in the university. Uh, they could be head of the department or something. They have to leave all these things behind. So again and again and again, the various possessions that each one has are oftentimes uh, an obstacle to the total dedication that's talked about here in the book of Revelation. The elder says, who, he, who, he was not dead to his self-will, this rich man, or his ego. That is why the gospel says that he left with great sadness. Some might say, well, see, he had sadness. He's a good guy. Well, that's true, and that's something, but it's not enough, is it? Because Judas had sadness. He had remorse, and yet he hung himself. So walking away from life and being sad about it is not going to be translate into redemption. It's not going to translate into life. We have to repent of those things. We have to reorient ourselves, and then we enter into life. And the Lord had compassion on him. It seems that he was a remarkable young person, but his, his existing wealth was already a hindrance. Christ felt sorry for him. How many times has the God-man Christ bowed down and searched the hearts of so many young men who are truly remarkable in all areas, but who in the end do not devote their life to Christ? They squander their existence in the world and on the affairs of the world. There are many. But there are also exceptions. We, I have an exception in mind, just came to mind as I'm speaking to you. Tremendous exception. And I hope to be somebody who will come more and more into the life of the church. And in our, all of our lives, maybe if God blesses. But he was in the midst of the glories of authority and money. Left it all behind, became a monastic of Mount Athos. And uh, is extremely well educated and all those things. He left it all behind. It's a mystery. A mystery that it's all being worked out within the heart of man. Uh, if one is going to, the one could have one in the same position as the other, could be right next to each other, and one squander their existence of the world away, and the other to leave all that behind and have life eternal. So these are the ones following the Lamb wheresoever he may go. There's three things here that the elder wants to point out. This expresses, one, number one, their absolute participation in every hardship for the name of Christ. Their absolute participation in every hardship for the name of Christ. It expresses, again, mission or evangelism as well. Because they're following wherever he go. So they're serving him, teaching, preaching, serving the church. And then also it expresses and points to martyrdom wherever he may go. And where did he go? He went to the cross. And so hardship, mission, and martyrdom are the three things. Let's start with hardship, participation in hardship as a characteristic of those who follow the Lamb. So there has to be a willingness to suffer hardship. By the way, all of this we should turn in on ourselves as I'm talking. We talk, listen to the elder as I'm presenting what he's teaching and the scriptures, what he's interpreting in the scriptures, and then turn it on ourselves and look at ourselves and say, how am I doing on this? This willingness to suffer hardship. Basic rule. If I begin to rationalize and question the necessity of this hardship, then I am not worthy of Christ. This is right at the door of all of us, including all the monastics and all everybody, everyone. This is the devil's main tool, right? Rationalize, question, do I really need to fast? Do I really need to pray? Do I really need to get up it's so early in the morning? All these things constantly are, and these are the choices we make between 
participation, and therefore redemption, regeneration, purification, illumination, right? And remaining as we are and not totally the full stature of, of, of Christ, right? What does the Apostle Paul say to Timothy? He said, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me from uh, heard from me before many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So a, dis, a, a disposition, a readiness, a willingness to suffer hardship. Basic characteristic of the Orthodox Christian, the followers of the Lamb. Number two, mission evangelism. This is something we need to hear a lot in the Western world, especially in the English-speaking Orthodox world, where we have things have gotten a lot better, but still have a lot of problems. We have these uh, parishes that are char characterized as Orthodox Christian parishes, but they're also characterized by other criteria, other, other, other uh, uh, names and identities, which are not are at the top. They're at the top of the hierarchy. They come before the name of Christ or before the name of Christian or before the name of Orthodox Christian. And ultimately, as, as before when we saw, if you love your parents or you love your children more than Christ, you lose both. You don't know how to love Christ or your parents, right? Remember how we said that? The same thing here. We love our nation or our ethnic identity or our whatever ethnicity. No, let's not think that American ethnic identity or the English ethnic identity or whatever is somehow accepted. They're all in the pot. If you love your Ameri meridoxy more than Christ, you got a big problem. It, it, it's really quite ironic. We've been struggling in orthodoxy in the 20th, in the last, I'd say, 40 years to bring all of the Orthodox Christians into line with the proper understanding of mission, evangelism, and all the rest. And yet we see a process slowly developing among some of those convert parishes that are becoming very much like the things they were criticizing 20, 30, 40 years ago. And they're making their own uh, parish into a kind of ethnic ghetto. And instead of like old school ethnic uh, identity. They have the American identity, meridoxy, as I as I call it, where they they've brought orthodoxy down to their level of of a kind of a, a mix of orthodoxy and Protestant ethos. And there's these things that they justify, and we don't do this, and we don't do that because we're in America, and all this stuff. And they don't realize they're doing exactly in a different way, yes, but not much different. They, the hierarchy is being lost among them as well. You can see this in different places around the world, around the, in the United States anyway, and people talk about it and share, and they share their experiences. They say, this is what's going on in this parish. It seems like they have yet to really put things in right order and understand, first and foremost, follow the fathers, the Orthodox faith, the Orthodox orthopraxia, the Orthodox way, and then all the rest. And then all the justifications and all the, well, we do things differently because we're Americans. There's there's a, almost an elitism about it. Like we're American. So we can just we can just distort and twist things a bit to, to fit into our, our uh, unique American uh, landscape. Not a legitimate economy, which is rare, but it's that it exists and certainly it's possible, but a rather a a identity uh American identity that's that does change the way things we've been doing doing things for generations and 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 ages, and they're they're twi they're 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 justified as small t. I think one of our uh, in our last live stream or two two live streams ago, there was a Latin uh, theologian uh, apologist, and he was talking about small t and big t and all these kind of distinctions, which really aren't orthodox. They're not really orthodox. I don't think they really make sense at the orthodox context. Kind of you don't hear Father. Elder Athanasius is just talking about that at all. Uh, anyway, I'm a little off topic. Let's go back now to the example of mission evangelism, St. Innocent of Alaska. And it's very interesting. Elder Athanasius, now this is 1980s. I don't think he had any real extensive life of St. Innocent, even translated into, into Greek. And yet he wants to talk about St. Innocent. And as you'll see in the next slide, St. Nicholas of Japan. He wants uh, St. Nicholas to be... Um, 
an example for his Greek speaking uh, listeners. He says, look at this example of what it means to be a follower of the Lamb in the mission field. He traveled to Moscow, this is St. Innocent, from St. Petersburg in a cramped sleigh. He spent entire months in a dog sleigh and sometimes even a reindeer sleigh traveling thousands of miles through Siberia, weathering austere conditions to finally make it to Alaska. When returning, he chose to venture on a more southern course through China. Today, simply hearing of such an adventurous journey can be dumbfounding. It's just un unbelievable for most of us, right? We can't imagine it. Keep in mind that he traveled to Alaska two times under the same conditions. So he wants to show you the dedication, the total commitment of those who are going to be counted in the book of Revelation are being, are being re recognized and praised. And St. Innocent is one that came to him came to mind. I think it's pretty wonderful for us in America who have him as one of our protectors. Uh, and it's also noteworthy to say that he lost his youngest child and his wife, he fell asleep in the Lord during his absence when he was traveling. So he had that added pain. So in spite of all that, he didn't lose heart, but he continued on and was a great missionary. And then he continued back and became the Metropolitan of Moscow at the end of, part of, end of his life. What an amazing example of one dedicated to the Lamb. Another great example commemorated by Elder Athanasius, St. Nicholas of Japan. A few dec decades later, St. Nicholas followed. So this, is, this would have been mid-19th century, St. Innocent, late 18th and early 19th century. A few decades later, St. Nicholas followed in his footsteps and dedicated his life to evangelizing Japan. He even became the first bishop of Japan. Up to that point, it was a fortress of idolatry, and more specifically, the worshiping of ancestors. He is the only Orthodox Christian who broke through this formidable wall, and the roots of Orthodox Christianity took hold in Japanese soil for the first time in 2,000, 1,850 years. How amazingly intrepid these people are. What adamant willpower they must have had. St. Nicholas lived from the 1st of August in 1836 and reposed in 1912. And I think I'm getting the numbers right, but I might be a little bit off. I think it was 30,000 converts and baptized Japanese uh, on his repose. I think he went there in the 60s. So he was there, what? 50 years, 45 years, something like that. And so in his life, something like 30,000, if not 30,000, it was certainly tens of thousands. I'm not sure exactly. I don't remember the number exactly. And then there's mission, and then there's us. How are we doing? How are we doing on the mission field? We look at these great examples. What of us today? Well, he's talking to the Greeks in the 19. 80s, and he says, today we hesitate to become involved with the slightest missionary effort, even a few steps from our home. Even a few steps from our home. Is that too small? I wonder if there, what should we do? I was just thinking of that. Eh, sorry. After the resurrection, the Lord approached the apostle Peter, and he asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And what did the Lord say to him? Oh, would you write me a card? What did he say to him? Would you show me by cooking some breakfast? Or what, did he, what do you think he said to him? He said, feed my sheep. In other words, exercise your apostolic gift. I gave you this blessing of being the chief of the apostles. What are you doing with it? Do the work of the apostle. That's what it means to love me. So do the primary work of the apostle, which is spreading the gospel. If you do this, uh, if you will truly love me, that's what it, that, that's what it will mean to truly love me. That, that, that applies to everyone to a, to a lesser or greater degree, of course. Obviously. Uh, we're not all in the same boat exactly, right? But, and we're not, there's only one Apostle Peter, one Apostle Paul, as you see here, but 
analogously, we apply. So we talked about mission. We talked about dedication, readiness for hardship. We talked about mission and evangelism. Now martyrdom, the ultimate sacrifice and love. The followers of the Lamb do not remain on the sidelines at the bleachers. They don't remain outside of the arena. If you're a follower of the Lamb, you are in the arena. You're in the struggle. Also, Paul writes, in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. This is one of the most mysterious lines of St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, and one of the most amazing and deep and is loved by Elder Athanasius. She talks about it at least a few times now. I've encountered it. So what does this mean? I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. For some, I think today, I'm not even sure if it's limited to any particular group, but for some across the board, this is almost blasphemous. What does he mean? Especially, I think, among some Protestants, this would be really hard to put their head around. How can there be something lacking in Christ's afflictions, right? What do they make of it? How do they describe it and, and explain it? I don't know. But this is what the elder has to say. What is lacking means the sufferings that Christ did not suffer due to time limitations. He was only here in his mission for three years. But his body continues. It's his body. We are members of his body. and so. In this body, that those afflictions are continuing against Christ. He says as much to Paul on the road to Damascus. He says, why do you kick against? Like you, you are kicking against me when you kill my disciples or seek to kill my disciples. So due to those time limitations, Christ has something lacking. In his body, but it's still Christ. That's what people don't get. Christ stayed on the cross only three hours. After his ascension, his body, the church, will continue his passion on this cross. We will be lifted up with him. That's what Paul's talking about. It's unbelievable. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. And it's essential that we understand this. So martyrdom is to fill up in my flesh the afflictions. Uh, the lacking in Christ's afflictions, that which is lacking. Now, we may understand why St. Paul does not say, I fill up the things lacking in the afflictions of Christ in my soul. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say it in my mind. I fill up the that which is lacking in my mind. He doesn't say that. This does not refer to an intellectual state or exercise or an articulate metaphorical figure of speech. This is not what Paul says or is meaning here. He says, Something much deeper. He does not employ allegory, but he says, in my flesh, in my flesh, this is so scandalous to the Gnostics of our day, right? In the flesh and in the body of Christ. And he's here and not there. And you've got to participate in the mysteries to be saved. You've got to be initiated through baptism and chrismation and communion to be in the body of Christ. This is the anathema of those Protestant Gnostics who can't get their head around there being a Christ in this world who walks just like he did. 2,000 years ago, it's his body, and he is in the midst of the world, and you have to connect with him in time and space. And this is another example of this. It's in his flesh, referring to his long catalog of personal suffering. How many times was he beaten, whipped, day and night, in the bottom of the sea, inside the dark dungeons of ships, in danger from thieves, danger from the synagogue, his own people, suffering in hunger, thirst, adversity? This adversity, all this hardship can be summarized by the word cross. So he ascended the cross. He ascended the cross. Who else ascended the cross? Christ ascended the cross. And his disciples ascend the cross because we are his body. So I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. This is magnificently profound, the elder says. I want to read that again. I feel in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. In other words, we're talking about the body of Christ. It's still going on. It will go on until the second coming. There's still more afflictions to suffer. There's more, uh, more who will send the cross. And that's the place where the followers of the Lamb exist, in that space of being crucified in the world, being crucified in their mind, their desires, right? That's what it means to be a follower of the Lamb here. 
following him wherever we go, even to crucifixion. So we see some more else. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 31 say, says, I die every day. Another expression of the same mystery. I die every day. Every day I die. Do we can we say that even remotely, just a little bit? If we die to our desires, if we die to our, our, our will today, did we die to our laziness today? Did we die to our lust, our pride, our arrogance, our judgmentalness? Did we die? Are we dying? And the Apostle Paul, far greater than that, he died in many other ways that were inflicted upon him, as do many of the saints. They have external persecution, which is another expression of this dying daily and being crucified. The Apostle says to him, and this is John 11, 8, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? This is interesting. Listen to this. Thomas, called the twin, he was deeply moved. He said to his fellow disciples, expressing this dying of desire to die daily with Christ. He says, let us go also that we may die with him. So this, this dying daily, this desire to be crucified with Christ, we see it here as well in John 11, 8, 11, 16. And when Pentecost came and he had the fullness of the meaning of the presence of Christ, then he most certainly was lifted on up onto the cross on which Christ was crucified. All the disciples, all the Christians ascend the cross. They must be lifted up on that cross. What is the antithesis of that secularization? The spirit of Antichrist. The opposite of that. Come down from the cross, they said to him. Do you remember? Show us that you are the king. Come down from the cross. That's the great temptation. That's the great lie. That's the great uh, methodology of Satan to make sure the Christians are not a part of the body, which is saving and being crucified. They're not a part of the mission. They're not a part of martyrdom. They're not being followers of the Lamb. Come down from the cross. He says, they said that to Christ, they say it to all of us. Come down from the cross. Sleep, drink, be happy. Watch the circus, eat the bread, right? And go on and don't worry. Don't worry, it doesn't matter. You're, you're in a sinful life. We're all in sinful lives. Don't you hear that, right? Justify it. They're blessing homosexual couples. They bless all kinds of sinners. It doesn't matter. Totally antithetical, antithetical to the cross, to the, to the desire for hardship, to the desire for martyrdom and mission and all the rest, right? So this is it. It's everywhere. It's, it's all around us. This come down from the cross. So he was lifted up with all the apostles. The statement, those who follow the Lamb, expresses the imitation of the Lamb in this way, right? St. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of, of Christ. That's the hierarchy we were talking about earlier. Paul was an imitator. Imitate me. We imitating Paul. Imitate Christ. And therefore, the hierarchy and salvation. But what if, what if Paul was not Paul? He was a heretic. He was a worldly-minded. He went and prayed in synagogues or in Hindu temples. And preached perennialism. What do we do then with such examples? Well, we don't do, we're not imitating them anymore, are we? That's for sure. That's the first thing. No more imitation there because the, they're not imitating Christ, they're imitating the apostles. And unfortunately, in our day, the last days, we have such people who are preaching the gospel of perennialism, the gospel of universalism, the gospel of pan heresy of ecumenism. These are the special Christians who become Christ-like, the ones who imitate and are lifted up on the cross. They become Christ-like. They reflect Christ. They go from the image to the likeness. That's the whole of the spiritual life. You've been restored in baptism, chrismation, and communion. You've been restored. The image is restored within you. Now we move on from that to the likeness. 
That's what's going on here. How do we, how do we attain the likeness? This, this should be our main question in our life. What are we doing to attain the likeness? To be like Christ, we're right there. Lifted up on the cross. Imitating the apostles, imitating the saints, imitating our Lord, first and foremost. They developed the mind of Christ, these followers of the Lamb. Those who increase according to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, quoting the apostle there. So very important. And this is extremely important. What happens now? We've dedicated ourselves, whether you're a priest, bishop, monastic, or baptized Orthodox Christian, all of us have dedicated ourselves. We've we've been dedicated and we've dedicated ourselves to Christ. What happens? Can we go back? What happens if we go back and we rescind that dedication? Such dedication must never be rescinded, he says, because it turns into sacrilege. So I, be, I, I dedicated myself as a priest in the church of Jesus Christ. Others dedicate themselves as monastics. Others dedicate themselves in other ways. There's a whole range of dedication. Whatever it is, do not go back. You cannot renege after you've forwarded, gone forward with this calling. You cannot change your mind and turn back. You cannot abandon the Lord. The Lord says, whatever is dedicated to God is called a holy offering. Therefore, the moment I surrender myself to be fully dedicated to God's service, I cannot turn back. I should choose to die before I do that. It is better to die, not to kill yourself. He does not mean that. God forbid. But he's saying that's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. It would be better for us to die, to be killed, whatever, to just not to go on than to turn back from the dedication. It is preferable that I die than to leave monasticism or leave the priesthood. Unfortunately, we have examples of those strugglers, those lovers of Christ, who somehow, some way, the enemy came in to their thought processes, to their desires. They lost heart. They lost inspiration, courage, and they were turned away. And they left behind the struggle. They left behind the dedication, the monastic tantra or the priesthood. We just had three last year that were very public, who were priests of the Most High God in the Orthodox Church, apostatized to Protestantism or Catholicism. And God helped them. God helped them to repent, to come back. They have turned back on their dedication. The elder goes on, I am bound by heavy vows. He was, of course, a monastic and a priest. Of course, I could choose to leave. We are free. There's no doubt about that. And they, you're free to leave. Christ does not force anyone to be a disciple. But it is not in my best interest spiritually. It is a great betrayal. That is why I must endure whatever emerges. Whatever emerges. And who knows what will come? Who knows? You might have, you might, your, your elder might die. Your wife might die. Uh, you know, whatever. God, God knows what's coming down the path. Whatever God allows, whatever emerges, it's not. It's a non-negotiable. We don't leave. It is extremely important to take into account this entire matter from the beginning before you commit. I was just talking to a friend of mine in Greece this morning, two, three hours ago, a young man who's related, becoming a priest. So he asked, we talked about you know, what, it, what, it's, what it means to be a priest today. I said, I have no doubt that he's going to be a fantastic priest, but just remember this. From the beginning, he needs to make a decision and take into account what it means to be a priest today. What does it mean to be a priest today? Be prepared to be defrocked. Be prepared to be persecuted. Be prepared to be moved to Siberia. Be prepared. If you are confessing, struggling, teaching, the forces that be, the demons and those who work and listen to them are going not to tolerate you. It's not going to it's not going to be there's no toleration today by the worldly and the world in and without the church so from the beginning the elder says knowing in advance that there is no remission for this commitment there's no going back extremely important absolutely need priests absolutely need clergymen today but those who are prepared to die to serve and be exiled and to be persecuted those are ones we need the rest are setting themselves up for putting something else above that 
commitment. The hierarchy is not correct. If you have, oh, I want to be a priest, but I also like to do X, Y, Z, and I want to have this, and I want to go there, and I want to have a house, and I want to, if you have that, big mistake. Not going to go well. The devil will absolutely use all that against you, and it will undermine your priesthood. And you will be, you will not, you will set out, perhaps many set out very zealous. I mean, we have a, a hierarch, a well known hierarch who was very zealous in the beginning. Now he's teaching heresy left and right. How does that happen? It's a mystery of, an, uh, of apostasy, of, a, of iniquity. No one really knows exactly when and how he made those turns and ended up in a far off land, spiritually speaking. So it's extremely important that we stay vigilant, humble, dedicated and not put anything else above that. Again, the hierarchy is so important. We're going to save, be saved and save ourselves from this generation. And that hierarchy, when you go into the priesthood, the monastic life, whatever it is you're going to do in the church, what am I doing? I've got a position now in the church. I'm teaching theology at the seminary, right? I met many people who teach theology at the seminary. I was in seminary for many years, and I taught in the seminary. They, that is a disease in academia. Not to lose their their place. Don't want to be thrown out of the synagogue, right? So, maybe literally for some, or at least the Masonic Lodge. Uh, so, there is a lot of temptations today, brothers and sisters. We've got to make the commitment and stay true to the commitment and not look left or right. Let's listen from Saint from the Syrian about this question of dedication to God. Every baptized Christian is dedicated to God. Listen to what St. Ephraim the Syrian says. Thus, it is necessary to keep our body from sins. So we will not lie to the Creator because we rendered ourselves as an offering to the Lord. And we no longer have authority over our own body. We no longer have authority over our own body. We rendered ourselves as an offering to the Lord. It's talking about all Christians in baptism, in chrismation, communion, initiation to the church. Among other things, the Holy Father says, if you donate an object and place it on an icon at the church, and subsequently you have a change of heart and take back this gift, you will be considered a thief. All right? So not even talking about ourselves. We're talking about an object. I take the object, I donate it to the church, I bring an icon or whatever it is, and then I say, oh, no, 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 I want that back. I'm a thief now. It's no longer mine. I gave it to it. It was Lord. It was consecrated to God. It was given to God. It was a gift to God. I take it back. He says, you're a thief. You did not only commit theft, but something worse. You committed sacrilege. You committed sacrilege. Very interesting. And this applies now, according to the elder Athanasius, you can apply this to our whole life. If that's the case with an object, how much for our own person that we've committed and offered and dedicated to God? How much more? So all are dedicated, and whether a monastic or married, it is not an end in itself, but rather a labor of love. If your monasticism or your marriage is not animated by this labor of love, dedication, commitment to Christ, and then also to the husband, wife, children in Christ, then we have a big derailment. And we have a problem. And we have many, many problems today because it's not the case. We don't understand marriage as a path to salvation, as an arena for working out our salvation, as a place to save our souls. We many, many people don't understand. Why are you married? Well, she's not mean. She's mean to me. She doesn't like me. She, he doesn't like me. On and on and on. When then the marriages dissolve because it's all about me. And we don't understand what we're doing. Why are we married? Why are we in the monastic life to begin with? Why are we there? The 144,000 follow and move in the direction of the Lamb because they love. Basic, basic. All, all the asceticism has to be uh, an expression of love. All the prostrations, all the prayers, all the fasting has to be an expression of love for Jesus Christ. That's why we're doing it all. It's got to be for Christ and in Christ, otherwise it doesn't save. Marriage is an offering, an offering of love and sacrifice. The I, ego in Greek, the ego, ego is the Greek for, word for I, becomes crushed within marriage. Is that happening to you? Are you married? Is your eye being crushed? You're, you're working out your salvation. Are you crushing the eye of the other person, the ego? You're not working out your salvation. 
And there's times when we're doing one and then we're doing the next one, next five seconds later, aren't we? Going back and forth between egotism and worshiping at our altar and then serving and loving Christ. If the ego of the man or the woman is not crushed, they will make each other's life unbearable and they will get divorced. He said it straight out. That's the that's the cause of divorces. Ultimately, ultimately, one or of the others, or both, ultimately both. Not always, but many times, are not being crushed, but are crushing. Thus, egoism, egotism is crushed within the marriage. If it's a proper Orthodox Christian marriage, that's what happens. And that is when true communion is opened up, when true communion in Christ, for Christ, happens, is when that egotism is crushed. That's the, that's the function here. That's the point. Why did Christ, why would Christ give us marriage if it didn't wasn't all about salvation? It doesn't make any sense. We don't need it for this short life. We need it for the eternal life. This could begin at least from one partner or the other, and the other will follow suit, right? So one is more advanced in this crushing of their ego and serving their neighbor, right? And hopefully the other one is taking an example and struggling also to. But if the latter does not follow, then at least the former can preserve the institution of marriage. So sometimes the, there's one that doesn't want to crush their ego. They're not really interested. They're not understanding. And so the other one has to crush again and again and again. And he says here, but at least in this way, marriage is maintained, which is a dedication, right? So you, you got in this, this marriage, monastic life, the priesthood, it's all kind of work, works similarly as a dedication to Christ. You don't leave that. It's a sacrilege to walk away from it. If they walk away and you're forced out and you're forced because they don't want, I mean, that's a different thing. But if you don't walk away, no matter what the other person is, don't walk away, he's saying. Preserve, the, at least preserve it for your salvation's sake if they don't want to be saved. If the latter does not follow, he says, then at least the former can preserve the institution of marriage. For this reason, marriage is an offering of love and an arena to crush egotism. This love is offered to the other human being, to the spouse, the children, and so on. So through our neighbor, our brother, our sister, our mother, our father, our wife and children, all of those, we see Christ. Christ is, is in our midst, and we serve him, and for him and in him, our salvation is worked out. This is how it's all been arranged in the great providence of God. The offering of love takes on greater dimensions, however, in the life of virginity, the monastic life, where the neighbor is not just the spouse or children. By the way, St. Paisius says beautiful things about this right here. Leaving the small family, he opens it up to the whole family of all humanity, and all of the, all people become his brother and sister. This is the great struggle of the monastic. The neighbor includes the entire world and even irrational creation. And so we see in the lives of the saints, the great elders of asceticism, monasticism, we see them loving not only people, but animals, plants, and indeed all of creation. St. Seraphim of Seraph is a great example. He has his icon there great ascetic in the early 19th century in Russia, who loved people, but also loved the bears of the forest and fed them, for example. But we have many examples, don't we? We have many examples in, in, uh, in church history. We have St. Paisius the Athenite doing the same thing. We have St. Paisius the Athenite, who is uh, uh, talking to animals, feeding them, directing them, and all the rest. There's many examples of that return to the harmony of paradise in the lives of the saints. Marriage somehow allows for a limited radius of love. That shouldn't be the case, but it often is. It has hindrances, difficulties, and does not allow one to venture beyond the limited radius. That's, again, not what should happen, but it oftentimes does. That's the one of the big differences between monastic life and married life. People don't really think about this difference, do they? But it is, in de facto, a difference. When the married man or woman comes home, he, he oftentimes meets a wife or a husband <clears throat> who says, I have rights, I have desires, I have demands of you. 
And therefore, they are bound to focus there narrowly. The radius is, is very narrow because of this other co-struggler who wants all the attention. In the monastic life, ideally, then it, we could have such dysfunction there, I'm, I, undoubtedly as well, but it's not meant to work that way. You don't have the same dynamic and the same radius, certainly a greater radius in the monastic life. Um, so to a certain extent, they apply to every Orthodox Christian, This, these uh, struggles and temptations, right? Um, so we say that about the monastic life, we say that about the married life, but in fact, at the end of the day, we're all included in the same one life and way of Christ. We make these observations, these distinctions, but there's only one gospel. There's only one way which is Christ himself. We have all that in common. The differences are are not essential. There, there, there are differences in degrees. There are differences in structure. Uh, there are differences in modes, perhaps. I mean, you know, we they don't we don't have children in marriage, uh, in master life, obviously. You don't have marriage. You don't have money. You know, you have vows of uh, poverty and and chastity and uh, you don't have the same thing in the marriage. So there are those differences, but the essential gospel call and struggle and way is identical. And so that's extremely important that we don't fall into the delusion that you do see, uh, unfortunately, in looking for justification oftentimes among lay people who say, oh, that's for the monastics. That's for the monastics. In Corinthians, we read the Apostle Paul talking about the following. And now we've arrived at number three. We talked about Mission, now we're in martyrdom. The Apostle Paul says, Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Have you ever seen an exegesis of this from the church fathers? You're going to hear one now. I think it's readily misunderstood by most. From now on, he says, talking to those. In the church, I think he's obviously it's addressed also ultimately is being addressed to all Orthodox Christians. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. So he's talking to married people and he said, live it. But what's he really saying here? Is he saying split, don't have relations? Is that what he's saying? That would be one interpretation, but I think a superficial interpretation. So if we actually look at this, in other words, those who are married and required to are required to live the life of the gospel. That's what he's talking about. They cannot limit their love to their wife and children, but must be expanded beyond the family radius. So that's the difference, the Orthodox Christian. The normal way of the world is for this radius to be very narrow. The Orthodox way, the Christian way, is for it to be expanded beyond the family. You see this in, for instance, St. Porphyrios, oftentimes, in the pedagogy of the children, it's often pointing the parents beyond to loving the neighbor's children. You want your children to be well and go well? Love the neighbor's children, he says. So pointing us beyond that, that because it, beca it can become very insular and egotistical in the name of loving the family, the children, mother, the wife, the, the husband, it can become very problematic. So we have to, if we're going to live the gospel, the life of the gospel, we cannot limit our love to our wife and children, but go beyond. Otherwise, they will hear, he says, the terrible reply in the parable of the master's banquet. Truly, I say to you, none of these will be accepted in the banquet. In other words, none of those, none in those categories there will enter the kingdom of God. So we're called beyond. We're called beyond that. Um, Yes. So I'm sorry that that I just realized that martyrdom is a is a mistaken uh, title for that that card. That's why I was thinking, what what is that about? No, it's not about martyrdom. Uh, I guess in a way it is, but not not directly. So now we're going to move on to fourteen four, the second part, and talk about uh, the second part of fourteen four, and talk about the first fruits. The first fruits. He says there, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits from God and the Lamb. 
So what's this about? First, fruits. So they're selected from the people. They're selected, redeemed, uh, and offered as the first fruits to God and the Lamb. So among the people, among the people of God, among the people of the world, and the people of God, there's selected these 144,000. They were offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb, and they were selected. That's as it pertains to those who've been redeemed from mankind. They've been selected out of mankind, they've been redeemed, and they've been selected. As to the question, the second part, for God and the Lamb, here we see the equality in divinity. The equality in divinity, God and the Lamb, the Son. They're one. They share the same essence. They are equal. And in, in this passage, very important. I think if we go back, and let me do that quickly, to the King James Version. I think we talked about this last time. And we have a problem, don't we? Because we don't have God. Uh, oh, no, that's a different section. I'm sorry. It does say in the King James Version, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Okay. So that was actually a previous a previous uh, uh, section that we were examining. So in the Old Testament, we don't have just an any offering, right? It's not just any offering. The offering had to be the best, the first fruits, the prime. And if it's not the first fruits and the best, what happens? We resemble Cain or Kine. Cain, I think in English, kind is the Greek. So that is what happened to him. He didn't offer the best. He didn't offer the first fruits. He didn't offer the the, the best to, to the Lord. So even in the Old Testament, we don't just have, oh, it's an offering. Just offer it, a, you know. We didn't go to, you know, this whole disposition of the modern man and the American, especially, I would say, and speaking as an American, uh, it's just so slipshod and shoddy. Right, go to church and whatever whatever clothes we have. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. So many people they end up in divine services or in vespers or in parishes or or wherever, and and they're not properly dressed for going and offering the best. They want to offer the best. How are you going to offer the best when you come in your you know tennis shoes or whatever? And I'm not going to get particulars, but it's the disposition. It should show. And all of it should point as an offering of sacrifice. You sacrifice. Your, if you, of course, there are extenuating circumstances. People are poor. I understand that. But generally speaking, even the poor, many of them are, are going to put that priority. That was one of the great characteristics of the pious: is that even with the little money they had, they did first and foremost for Christ, and they bought and they had their church Sunday dress. Right? They didn't go to church in just any dress, but the Sunday dress was special. That's an expression of this being attentive to the offering we're making. Now, that's an external thing. It's a simple thing. It's not the internal offering, obviously, of our, our, our best thoughts, our best disposition, you know, our, our energy, our struggle, all the rest. But it's indicative. And it's, it points to, I think, oftentimes, an esoteric dis disposition. And so if we can't get that right, which is pretty basic, I don't know. We could, we're just babes. So we've got to get that right. We're going to church. We're going to go with our best. We're going to spend money and time. Uh, we're going to go in clean clothing. I mean, really basic stuff. We're going to cut our hair so it's not, uh, you know, all over the place or whatever. We're going to, that's a sign of our, of our desiring to offer the best. This means that the 144,000, which is a symbolic number and refers to the great crowd, right? This massive crowd. We're outstanding people in all respects. So the, the 144,000, the, the followers of the Lamb, these, these dedicated, uh, pure human beings were outstanding in all respects. They didn't, they worked on themselves, they were worked on by the grace of God, and they were regenerated and renewed in many ways. Whether they had a beautiful soul, bodily or spiritual capabilities or nobility of class, or high worldly positions, or physical strength, or physical beauty, or health, or whatever great 
attribute, whatever it was. And we have many, many examples in church history of kings and queens and nobles and all the rest, right? And and and, and many uh, great and intellectuals and all the rest. They gave it to God. That's the characteristic. They gave the best to God. That's a characteristic of those who are being saved who are among the 144,000. So we must not take the finest things and use them for our own pleasure and consumption. We should, we must not take the finest things, the greatest things, the most expensive things, and use them for ourselves. If you're doing that, that's a sign there's something not ordered. We have a disorder. We don't have a hierarchy that's properly ordered in our head. What's first? Where do we go with our best? What do we do with our money, our time? Are we offering it to God? We don't expend all that on our egotistical pleasure and consumption. People say, many times you hear this in the old country, I don't know about in America as much, but people say it in, in, in Greek circles, and I think probably in a lot of other ethnic, quote-unquote, ethnic churches, oh, it's a tragedy. This man was brilliant, and he became a priest or a monk. He could have succeeded and made so much money. The worldly person, right? Looks at somebody like, you know, a very educated person who went to whatever, you know, some great college, some university, was at a beautiful future ahead of himself, become rich and powerful and beautiful and whatever. And he left it all behind. And they think that's a terrible thing. Rather, he dedicated himself to God precisely because he had great potential, because he was intelligent, because he had these things, that he offered these first fruits. And this is a great and wonderful thing. We should be praising and giving glory and thanks to God that they offered those things to God. But, you know, up, upside down uh, from the... Uh, gospel, which is inverting the world, the world wants to turn it back up and make it send everything sense in this world, uh, make sense of everything in this world and not have any relation to the next. St. Nicodemus, with regard to people who live their lives as young and say, oh, when I get old, I'll fast and pray and I'll go to church, right? That's, that's something in the old country as well. Well, now it's my time to make money. Now it's my time, you know, to to get an education. Now I'm going to spend all my, my years in my 20s and get like three degrees. And I was talking to someone, it's actually several people, they spent their 20s and early 30s getting degree after degree after degree and whatever. And then they're 40 now and they're not married and they're in depression, utter depression. Because when they were supposed to be attending to the things that are higher, the things that fill the soul with and help us on the path of salvation, they were attending to the things of this world. And now they're in total shambles. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to repent. That's all we got to do. We got a short life, maybe a couple more years. Repent. Go back. Dedicate yourself to God. Whatever happened, happened. No going back now. St. Nicodemus the Hagarite addresses this beautifully. He says, my poor dear. Talking about these offering our old, old age to God. We're going to offer our not our first fruits, but our old age to God. He says, my poor dear, then you will not be leaving sin. It will be deserting you due to your old age. Now, there's some area that is especially true what he just said. And where is that? Sexual relations. There are those who want to expend all their early years in sexual relations and say, oh, later on, later on, I'll do, I'll fast from sexual relations. In marriage, obviously, we're not talking about outside marriage. But those who are in fornication, that's certainly a mentality that we observe. So what about fasting when you want the relations for the sake of Christ? That the lawful things, we started this whole conversation tonight, I say the lawful things can be offered up to God. Do we think about that? This is an offering. I can offer up this desire and this passion and all this stuff. I'll now not offer it to myself. I'm not talking about relations which are, you know, obviously if someone's and wanting to have children and having relations for the sake of that. But the abundance of relations, excessively and all the rest. So that could be an offering, right? No, 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 when we get older. And even when they get older, even when we get older in this, in this sexualized age of ours, people are in their 50s and 60s and 70s or something, and they're still engaging themselves and desiring the sexual urge to be fulfilled and all the rest. And it's we can understand that. Who cannot... Understand that that is a very powerful thing. It's extremely powerful. But we've got to struggle to offer that up and then be freed from that because it's a kind of enslavement, right? It's a kind of enslavement. We've got to struggle 
offer it to God. Offer it. I'm not. I'm not going to desire that. I'm going to offer it. It's a. It's one of the things I can offer. So that will then speed our our. Um, uh, well, first of all, it's it's it's, it's offering to God a, a good thing, and and we will have spiritual benefit, but also speed our uh, command over the passions. Right? We'll become again in the driver's seat of our own soul instead of being driven by the passion. So this is what you want to offer God, my brother? The elder says, no, God wants our first fruits, our very best. Otherwise, our offering will not differ from the offering of Cain. So first fruits, characteristic of the 144,000. Another characteristic is there's no lies here. It speaks about their guileness and their sincere character. That's what's going on here in 14.5. What does it say? And there was found no falsehood in their mouth. No lies in their mouth, for they are blameless. That's 14.5. So here, a lie or a liar or falsehood is the inauthentic, not just the literal lie to tell a lie. It's more broader than that. Okay, so it's talking about the inauthentic or corrupt man who is not trustworthy, having lost his integrity. All right, so that's what this is. There's no falsehood in their mouth. In other words, there's none of this. Inauthenticity, corruption, not having, not being trustworthy, losing your integrity. That does not happen to a, what the, these 144,000. A true man is a sound and complete man, a sincere man of integrity, godlessness, straightforward in all his dealings, simple and straightforward. When you start to see machinations and gossip and all this, that's not a sign of this true man of this blameless man, right? And we see this all the time among Orthodox Christians even. Uh, of course, we're all struggling. But we see this, that there's all this innuendo and all this intrigue going on. And people aren't simple. People aren't straightforward. And they're, mm, and I, what is this? This is, a, this is a fall on the part of Orthodox Christians. Uh, the Lord said to Nathaniel, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. No guile, blameless, straightforward in all his dealings. St. Clement of Rome wrote in his epistle to the Corinthians, paragraph 12, when the Lord was asked by someone, when will your kingdom come? He answered, when the two become one and the outside as the inside. When the two become one and the outside as the inside. That's a fascinating and interesting phrase from in this epistle. How do the two become one? When we speak the truth to such a degree, when we behave in such a way as to think that there is only one soul in two bodies, two different people in the body of Christ, all the people in the body of Christ, we speak it in such a way, there's only one soul in two bodies, the two become one. We behave in such a way, we speak the truth in such a way, to such a degree that there's no division, duplicity, you know, but there's oneness, oneness in soul. In other words, a total lack of hypocrisy. When will your kingdom become? When there's a total lack of Pharisaism and hypocrisy between us Christians. Whatever I tell you, you believe, and whatever you tell me, I believe one soul and many bodies. That is a sign of a truly blessed Orthodox parish, Orthodox community, Orthodox monastery. Whatever I say, you believe. Whatever you say, I believe. Oneness, no hypocrisy, no doubt. And the outside to be and speak like the inside. The outside to be and speak like the inside. This, this is characteristic of the Father. All right, so last, last uh, or second to last uh, card, if you want, if you have questions tonight. You want to ask questions over at Crowdcast or over uh, wherever we are, uh, let me know. Don't see any questions at Crowdcast. A lot of people, I see a lot of people over at the Crowdcast are going over to uh, and using YouTube. Is that, is that, you all see that as well? I see that more and more. But it's all right. On Tuesday nights and Wednesday, Monday nights like tonight, that's not surprising. The Christian... As a true man, who one who abounds in truth. We see this in Psalm 14 or 15, depending on your 
on the numbering, the numbering of in the West. The Christian is a true man, one who abounds in truth. Let's go through it really quick. O Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? What's the tabernacle here? Tabernacle is the Ark of the Covenant. It's where it's the tent, rather, the tent where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. That's the tabernacle. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And who shall dwell in thy, in thy holy mountain? The holy mountain is Mount Sion. The holy hill is Mount Sion. This is what we're talking about in this particular context. And then he says, He that walketh blameless and worketh righteousness, speaketh truth in his heart. This is a description of a Christian, a true man, right? So one who walks through life without blemish, without accusation, is a worker of virtue. Are we workers of virtue? Is that our main goal? What are we doing on a daily basis? My concern is that I walk without blemish, without lies, without hypocrisy, without accusation, without all this, right? And that I'm a worker of virtue. I'm cultivating the virtues and struggling against the passions. He's working righteousness. It's very interesting. Essentially, that's like I'm doing that which is true. That, that's the way it would be maybe in Hebrew. I'm doing that which is true. I'm working righteousness. It doesn't say he speaks the truth. He's doing the truth, right? And, and that means he speaks the truth from his heart. It's bubbling up from his heart. He worketh righteousness because it's in him. It's not just on his lips, but it's in his life. Uh, and so it's not enough just to speak it, but you got to have the workshop of the heart. The virtues are being worked out in the workshop of the heart. That's where the truth and the righteousness is being lived and and working. One is working on that and in that, not just in, on, on the lips. And this is much, of course, much different, isn't it? And much harder. No comparison. And then it goes on. Who hath not spoken deceitfully with his tongue, neither done hath done evil to his neighbor, nor taken up a reproach against those near him. So he does not slander, does not entertain anything evil against his neighbor. Um, he's what you see is what you get, is a straightforwardness and a sincerity. Number four, in verse four, he says, In whose in his sight, he that worketh evil is set at naught. So a vile person is despised, is another translation. All right, so the worker of evil, the vile person, he's set at naught. He's despised. He doesn't. People, they don't want to be with him. So he doesn't honor the one who does evil. He despises the depraved man's actions. So when you look upon the world and all the depravity and all the depraved people, you don't say, you don't honor that, but you despise it. That's a sign of a Christian who is a true man and abounds in truth. Uh, and he doesn't seek friendships companionships and partnerships with such people. This is one of the things we reserve today, even among hierarchs in the Orthodox Church, certainly among the worldly, is that there's this idea, listen carefully to this, it's a sickness of our day, there's an idea that if I'm a priest or a bishop or a patriarch or, or, or a professor of theology, I have, some, I have some, some status or something, I must go and keep company with with all kinds of people, even if they're not interested in the gospel, even if they're antithetical to the gospel, even if they're totally unrepentant, but I'm a diplomat. And, and, and they've made the Lord's mission to the world one of diplomacy, one of reconciliation in a superficial, worldly way. And all of this is a total distortion of the gospel, supposedly because we're going to keep company with the sinners. We hear this all the time. Well, no, we need to be close to sin. The Lord was allowed around the sinners. What happened, though? They repented. He didn't, he didn't go and hang out, even though they had no disposition to repentance. They had no desire to, to, to follow him. He didn't keep company with people who despised him, the truth. This is nonsense. He, it, the church absolutely will be in the world, but not of it, among the sinners, but not encouraging the sin. This is what you see now with the latest papal uh, encyclical uh, they're, they're trying to spin this as some kind of uh, philanthropic uh, descent close to the sinner to bring them out of the sin. But there's no calling out of the sin. There's a blessing of, 
of a couple that identifies as a couple because what they're doing is sinful. I mean, that's a part of their identity as a couple. So you see the exact opposite. This is not what the Christian does. Please, brothers and sisters who are among the Roman Catholics and who are deluded and, just, and, and not understanding this, is very clear. Listen to what I'm saying here. Listen to what the elders saying, rather. A Christian, a true man who abounds in truth, does not seek friendships, companionships, partnerships with people who are messed in sin and unrepentant of that sin. Right? The vile person, or rather, I think the better translation is the one who worketh evil, is not, is said at naught by the righteous man, by the Christian who is a true man, a true uh, one abounding in, in truth, right? So does that mean that they're going to love the sinner? Of course they're going to love them. But the love, true love means to tell them the truth, not to bless them as a couple which is sinful and sinning and will continue to sin. And it's coming to get the blessing because they want to remain together in that sinful relationship. It's absolutely contrary to what true pastoral work would do, right? It would preach. The Lord preached repentance. First words out of the mouth, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. All right, enough of that. So then we go on. He glorifieth them that fear the Lord. He glorifieth them that fear the Lord. So he honors those who fear the Lord and keep God's commandments. He give oath to the to his neighbor and forsweareth not. Or another translation has, he swears to his own hurt and does not change. I'm sorry, who swears, the person who swears to his own hurt and does not change. That's an interesting, very different translation. Um, totally different translation here. So I'm not sure what to say. Um so someone, according to the elder here, does not violate his oath, of course. Uh, and he is not a man who breaks his promises. Going on, number five. He hath not lent his money on usury. Ooh, not many Christians left in the world today. He has not lent his money on usury. In other words, he doesn't give money and want them to pay him back with interest. And he has not received bribes against the innocent. What, what do all the bankers do with this? Well, how do they get around this one? Uh, many of the bankers are followers, uh, claim to be followers of the Old Testament. He has not lent his money on usury and has not received bribes against the innocent. Like Judas. Uh, so he does not lend money to his neighbor expecting to live on the interests, thus drinking the blood of the poor who borrowed from him. This is Elder Athanasios. He does not make or take bribes to accuse, sentence, and incarcerate the innocent and weak people. This is not the way of the true Christian. Anyone who does that, of course, is far from Christ. And then... He who doeth, doeth these things shall never be shaken. He who doeth these things in this in this psalm shall never be shaken. He will stay solid and unshakable in this present life and the life to come. This is the illustration of the blameless man. This is the illustration of the 144,000. This is the illustration of all those who are followers of the Lamb. This entire 15th psalm poetically echoes, echoes this spectacular image of the 144,000 virgins, those dedicated and blameless people. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully it's been very, I think, extremely edifying for all of us because this is the scriptures and the elders' teachings, and they're extremely edifying. Thanks be to God. So what do we have in terms of questions? We want to put them on the board. Do we have a way to do that? Or do we have questions at all? Um, it's time to ask them if you want. Don't have to. But if you do have questions, I'll start over at Crowdcast from Craig. Uh, so he says, can I fulfill the commandment of loving my neighbor by caring? Let me actually move that that way. 
and the question again can i fulfill the commandment of loving my neighbor by caring for animals if i move into the forest and become a hermit or a monk um not only that no you cannot because the hermit or monk what is he doing night and day but praying and that's how he fulfills his love for his neighbor and that is a very difficult task people who don't pray they don't understand how difficult it is anybody who tries to pray they're constantly struggling against their thoughts against their passions against their desires against their laziness their sleepiness and all the rest so if you were to be blessed to go into the desert as a hermit or monk which that would have happened only after you spent years in the cenobitic life you would be a warrior against the old man a warrior against the demons and a warrior for the sake through prayer of the whole world by name and also just by the prayer and then of course if god allowed you to have a whole you know neighborhood of animals and you love them certainly that that's true yes loving is the key whether, whether it be uh, it's not just loving human beings. We saw that with Saint Seraphim. He loved the animals. Saint Saint Paisus loved the animals and had uh, amazing relations with the animals. But they didn't just do that, and they wouldn't have that relationship with the animals if they hadn't been totally given over to prayer and totally in communion with God. So it goes together. If you're going to be in the desert and you're going to be doing it salvifically, you're going to be praying, and that's why you're going to have a relationship with the animals. That's going to be you know, like Adam in the garden. All right, let's see what other questions we have. Starred, let's go right here. First of all, I want to thank Miss Moo, whoever that might be, for being coming a member. Thank you. And everybody else who are members, God bless you. Amanda asks, Father Peter, I went to my first divine liturgy yesterday. I loved it. I left while they were starting communion. Is that unpolite? Service lasted more, the service lasted more 30 minutes. More 30 minutes? More than 30 minutes? I hope so. Do you want to say more than that? Divine Liturgy usually is not under one hour on a daily basis. On a Sunday, it's at least an hour and a half. And sometimes in different places, depending on the chanting, it could be even closer to two hours. So I... Uh, Here's the thing, Amanda. You're a, an inquirer. You're not a catechumen. Okay, so an inquirer uh, is is uh, is well, of course, of course, welcome. It's good to get to know somebody at the church. I, in my understanding, and this is Father Peter. Not unfortunately, not in my opinion, not done in a lot of parishes, but should be. Uh, those who are catechumens, which you're not, you're just an inquirer. Um, it is good for them at, after the gospel, after the gospel, to depart and to go and receive catechetical instruction or do something like read or something, but not be in for the rest of the divine liturgy. The rest of the divine liturgy is for those who are going to commune, right? So after the gospel, after the petitions for the catechumens, we start the prayers that are entirely focused on communing and the this, and praying for the descent of the Holy Spirit and the consecration of the gifts. If you're not communing, and as an inquirer or as a catechumen, you're not, there's really no reason for you to be there. Now, again, many parishes don't do this. So be prepared for no one to tell you this. I'm telling you what the tradition is, what the ancient tradition was, what they did in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries, and what so slowly, slowly among missionary-minded priests is being reintroduced, but it's very slow. And it's a good thing. Why? Because everything has its time. Everything has its place. And this was the way it was done for the first three, 400 years, 500 years. And it worked. <laughs> and the reason why it stopped happening was because everybody became Orthodox. Everybody became Christians. And so they were now uh, growing up in the faith. But now that we're back in a very missionary time and space and place, right, this should be reintroduced. And it will be good for everyone, especially the catechumen, especially the inquirer, because you will be able to process it when you have been thoroughly catechized. You'll be able to understand it, appreciate it. And as I've been told by others who've done this, they were catechumen for a year, year and a half, and they left after the gospel. They never participated in the divine liturgy, the second part. When they were finally baptized, chrismated, and communed, 
it was an unbelievably wonderful experience for the first time to be there and to commune. It just made sense, right? So what I would say, wherever you're going, I don't know and what the priest will tell you, but I would say, you know, may I come? I'd like first of all, get to know the priest, get to know somebody, make a connection, and then say, this is what I would feel comfortable with. Would you allow me to do this? I would like to be here up until the cherubim, or just before that, after the catechumen prayers. And then I would be, it would be if it's blessed, I would like to go to the parish hall or to the narthex and give me a book to read. Uh, and I think that you will be blessed. You'll be blessed if if this that if they bless you to do that, and you can do that. Um, that's the way you're going to be, I think, really um, make progress because it's 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 a blessed thing. It's, it's church church has been doing it for was doing it for uh, from the beginning, and it was uh, very beneficial for those who did it. Anyway, that's just my suggestion. Um, you'll see what the priest will tell you when you go. Consciously aware. I have a question. I see a lot of slander online about Yeron de Frem's monastery. I felt the need to reply, but I don't know if it's the best thing to do. What would you do? Uh, it's always good to help those who are listening. Perhaps the person who's slandering is not going to change, and it's unfortunate. But there are people online who are listening or watching, and they're getting affected, right? This, this poison is being spread. So in a simple way, uh, encourage everyone to do their own research, to go and find out for themselves, to visit and come and see. Encourage people to uh, do their own research as online as well. Talk to people who've been to the monasteries. Whatever you think, say a few things, right? Step one, two, three, four, five, and uh, and and put some light in there, and show how maybe this slandering and this one-sidedness is is a distortion, and they should they should not listen to it. But in a very simple and gentle way, I think it's blessed. Yes, I would do it. Jacob, is it worldly and Protestant to wear a suit to church? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, having said that, there are certain saints in our day, like St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, who didn't like ties. That was kind of his thing. And I think there's a reason, maybe there's a reason for that. For whatever reason, he he said, I think he said something like, he didn't like the idea of like this choking, this thing that looked like it was choking the person or something. But you don't have to wear a tie, is what I'm trying to say. But, you know, if you don't want to. Uh, but there, that, that was a, a certainly something that people did for quite some time and still goes on in different places in, in, in those parishes that have that deeper tradition and uh, modesty. Uh, but uh, to wear proper clothes uh, that, that are proper. To, I mean, it's so strange to me. You, know, you have people who, uh, who are going to secular events uh, you know, big dances or whatever it is, and they're totally dressed beautifully, right? They've spent thousands or hundreds of dollars on this dress. But for Christ, for the church, they don't dress up. They don't put the right clothes on. They don't seem to care. The first fruits, the best. Buy something that doesn't mean the best in terms of the worldly criteria. What we can offer the best. And there's certain ideas about what that is. And, and that's okay. That's We'll take that, that conventionality and we'll use it to express uh, what we can uh, in terms of offering the best. I mean, you know, somebody say, well, it doesn't matter. These are stupid things. No, it's whatever. It, that's the conventionality. And that's what's been understood as being the best clothing for this event, right? It's been socially acceptable for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is the, do that and show your respect in that way. I think it's perfectly good and it's not a Protestant thing at all. We are going to church to worship God and not a fashion show. Indeed, over overemphasizing dress code seems like it could lead to an inflamed ego and vainglory. It could, but that's the nature of the of the royal path. It's a tightrope you're walking. Uh, you don't overemphasize. Nobody's saying overemphasize. Just emphasize modesty and the best we can offer. Not a fashion show. Not egotism, not vainglory. You're doing it for Christ. And again, it doesn't have to be a particular, you know, doesn't have to be expensive. If you don't have money, don't, I'm not trying to push some kind of um, external agenda or some kind of ex external, uh, you know, um, competition, you know, for the, but as an expression of our love and offering the best, whatever that is, I don't know what that'll be. Certainly, if you let me put it this way, if you go to play, you know, touch football in a shirt and pants, or you go to work at the gym, or you go to work at your, you know, you work on cars, 
and you pretty much have the same clothes for everything, including church, is that really an expression of, wait a minute, now I'm going to church, I'm going to do something differently. This is set apart. You know what holiness means? To be set apart. So I just think there's something fundamentally wrong with, I'm going to treat church just like I treat playing football you know, on a, on a rainy day and working on my car and you know going to the beach like if that's how we understand there's no real external difference here we got to separate that out and say okay now it's different i'm gonna go that's what the motivation was at least the good motivation in the in olden days but there was a good motivation you know and it it was i think there was a good side to it father peter you mentioned one of your videos to pray for the repose for the reposed how does that help i thought their fate was sealed okay Thank you. So St. John Damascus says famously in his dogmatic uh, book on uh, the church, on, on the Orthodox faith, there is no repentance in Hades. Ukeste metanye and donavi. Okay, the Greek. So what does it mean? What is repentance? Repentance is me, myself, or you, reorienting ourselves, coming into synergy and reorienting ourselves to be with Christ, taking the initiative and responding and, and on our own volition and our own will to reorient ourselves to Christ. Okay, so that's not possible in Hades because there's no longer a body and soul as one, and that's what a human being is. And that's the great tragedy of the separation of the soul from the body is that this is not God's will. It was not God's will. It was a result of sin. But now it God has redeemed it all, and, and now it's a doorway to heaven, and we can talk all about that. But in any case, that's the state of man until the second coming, until the res general resurrection. So he cannot of himself change his own status. Does that mean the church can do nothing? Does that mean love is limited? No, not the experience of the church for 2,000 years. And there's tons of teachings on it from the beginning. The church prayed for the repose of those who've gone before and had, has had many, many signs and experiences of the saints witnessing to the efficaciousness of this prayer. The love of God and the love for and in God of the church has no bounds. And that love comes and unites itself to those who are in Hades. And Hades is not hell, by the way. Hades is the place where people go before the second, the second coming and the judgment. So... Um, there are those who depart and they have a foretaste of paradise because that's what they lived in this life. The saints or others who are righteous and glorious. There are those who were struggling all throughout their life. They departed. And they did not make the progress that they would like. And this is a and this reflects, and they're seeking and crying out for the prayers of the church. That's the people the church offers for. Those who are part of the church struggling and and maybe they're in a state where they're not fully or they're not as united to christ um and the and the love comes and and gives them consolation and gives them indeed uh let's say a push it gives them support it gives them uh a a net uh that they then are carried closer to christ on and there's the unity of the militant and the triumphant church and it's in divine liturgy. Where does that divine liturgy take place? At the throne of God. When we go to divine liturgy, where does it take place? Not on earth. Not like an earthly, worldly thing. It's not an earthly, worldly event. What is it? It's a spiritual event. And where does it happen? Where is the sacrifice that's never-ending, constantly being offered? And it's outside of time. It's once for all given, but it's a timeless event. It's at the throne of God. It's in heaven. So the church on earth and the church in heaven meet in the divine liturgy. And the prayers of the whole church are offered for those who are among the triumphant or among the church that's that's gone beyond before us, not necessarily among the, the righteous, but is there and their love and their and our communion, all of that is communicated to the whole body, to all the cells of the body, right? We're all united in Christ. Those who have gone before us, those who are living today, those who are coming. We're all united in Christ, and that oneness and that unity and that spiritual uh, the love brings great benefit. That's the experience of the church. I know that I'm not trying to give you a full scriptural, you know, 
and patristic defense here. I'm just trying to explain the basics. Question, are short sleeves immodest? I have an overheating problem and I have been taking my jacket off. Um, traditionally, the shirts, like for instance, when I went to Mount Athos in 1996, most monasteries, still goes on in many monasteries, but not all, most monasteries would not allow people into the monast into the church without long sleeves. It was not considered modest. It was not considered, it was considered something that would be, an, essentially what it, they don't want, they don't want distractions. We don't want distractions in church. And so the less flesh, the better, because there's less distractions. It really comes down to that. So when women go there and scantily clad, one of the, you know, besides them being disrespectfully immodest with their clothing, as it's been understood socially and conventionally, it's a major distraction. So they're not showing love of the neighbor and the man, especially, who's trying to focus and pray. They want to steal our attention, usually, uh, by their dress. They want people to look at them. Why else would they dress this way? If they cover themselves, there would not be the attention given to them. So they, those who, whether it be men or women, but usually it's women because of the social norms. And so it's a distraction. And so that's why the church, ascetics and others say, no, you wear, and you don't, you don't see monastics. You don't see nuns they don't you know none of them are wearing anything that would be a distraction so that's what's going on it's a practical thing as much as a ethical or moral thing is it weird that i did not i did the sign of the cross as a visitor to a church no not at all not at all i have struggled spiritually with trying to consume revelations alone and i find myself in a position of fearfulness attempting to read it again how may i properly prepare spiritually we don't read Revelation alone. That's the first problem. We read a Revelation with and under the saints and their guidance. That's why this whole series, I'm on what, Lecture 60 now or something, is at the feet of Elder Athanasios, who is at the feet of the saints. So do not read Revelation alone. Bad idea. It'll be very confusing. We'll read it step by step by step, slowly, slowly, as we've done over the last year and a half, two years. And we unpack it in the fullness, in the depths, as, as Elder Athanasius is doing here. And then we understand it. And, of course, it's so tremendously beneficial when we're doing it that way. It could be very problematic if we don't do it that way. You end up like a Protestant with all kinds of crazy ideas. Susie Booth. Susie says, so it is God who sends suffering to us or the devil? Why do good people suffer? This is the classic question, the classic question. I was always told that suicide is the only sin that cannot be forgiven, but the suffering, but suffering leads there. All right. So God is not the author of sin. God does not desire for us to suffer as his first will. Okay. So God has the the the, the his good pleasure, his first will. In Greek, it's called katevdokian thelima, his his uh, let's say, good pleasure or first will. I don't know if that's the best translation. And then there's the kataparahoresi in Greek, which means his what he allows. And what he allows has to do with our freedom. And, and so we misused our freedom, Adam and Eve, and we brought upon ourselves suffering. And now in this valley of tears and death, without Christ's incarnation, we would remain in the suffering which would not be salvific and eternally significant. But with his incarnation, his descent into Hades, and his ascension into second right hand of the God the Father, what he's done now is take all, all of our suffering and make it rede redeemable and redemptive. And he says, now through suffering you'll find life, and through suffering you'll find redemption, as I show you on the cross. And so by sending the cross, you're freed from those passions which beset you, which, dis which separate you from me, which are the result of sin and death, right? And so the Lord, through the very thing that we, plagued us, he saved us and he redeemed us. And so now through that same path, we also see, reach to a freedom and a, a, a union with God, which is freedom from death and sin. And so to answer your question, God doesn't send it by his own will. He allows it and he uses it and he redeems us through it. And without us going through that, we won't be purified. We won't be 
united to God. It's now a cleansing action upon those who love God. It's like, if you want to clean some really dirty something, you're going to have to scrub, 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 right? Well, if you're going to clean this dirty reality of this fallen world, there's going to be a lot of scrubbing. There's going to be a lot of suffering. And it's spiritual suffering as much as physical. Physical is not always visited to all the saints or all the people uh, necessarily. But there's got to be a pain of heart, which is love. Love and pain of heart are inseparable. So um, suicide is a sin that is uh, has always been understood to be essentially the la if it's a it's the last decision it's consciously made and it and it's uh, done it's the most grievous sin of all uh the church does not bury those who commit suicide precisely so that those who are in life do not think that suicide leads to heaven and you can become a, you can commit suicide and still be uh in the in the in the you know in communion essentially can you can you deny the greatest gift God gives you and be in communion with God? No. So suicide is always seen as extremely, extremely problematic and extremely terrible. And the church does everything it can to discourage it. Um, does suffering lead to suicide? Well, not really. Suffering without um, any reference to Christ, suffering while rejecting Christ, suffering that is not redeemed or redemptive, yes. Um, suffering that's nihilistic. But when we're in Christ and we love Christ and we're seeking Christ, all of these things take on, uh, can take on a uh, function of unity with God. So far from suffering leading to our death or something like suicide, it actually leads to life. So suffering in and of itself does not lead to suicide, no. It's how we encounter it how we deal with it everyone will suffer everyone suffers it's a question of how we're going to live that and how it's going to be redeemed and it's going to translate into communion that's or not right that's the question i don't know not the best answer but hopefully it helps you how would you explain the desire to be martyred to a secular person so we don't desire to be martyred like per se like i'm going to go be martyred that's not something you see in the saints but well I shouldn't say that. Occasionally, that does appear to be the case, but that's, if you look at it in context, it's after a long process and there's historical, like the Lord is allowing for it. Uh, but we don't go, we don't go looking to be, you know, killed by unbelievers. We accept it if it's God's will. We, we prayerfully accept it, but we don't necessarily go seeking it. There's, there's exceptions to that, and it's beyond the pay, uh, pale right now to, Try to answer it all. We have new martyrs, for instance, in, during the Turkish period who denied Christ, but then went back and confessed him, knowing that they would be martyred. But um, I don't think we try to. First of all, I don't think we need to explain the try to explain the spiritual life to somebody who is a secular person. Secular person meaning who doesn't interest, not interested, and does not live the spiritual life. It's not something you can easily explain. Um, so it's kind of futile. Uh, Hopefully that answers your question. Next. Is gambling a sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's a terrible use of your freedom and time. Uh, it's extremely addictive and destructive. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, is a, um, it is not anything what we talked about tonight. <laughs> gambling does not at all uh, somehow uh, cause correspond to and uh, lead you to be a follower of the Lamb, uh, to be uh, somebody who's being purified, uh, someone who is dedicated to Christ. You're using your resources and your time in a terrible, terrible way. Uh, and, uh, of course, the demons love it. They love people who waste their time and money uh, and do not give it back to God and give it to their neighbor. And, of course, there's tremendous greed involved in gambling. And now you're going to say, well, no, I just do it as a hobby i just uh, it's a game there's better things to do with your time there's better things to do with your money give your money back to god give it to your neighbor don't waste it on gambling and it's that you won't find any saint ever who said go gamble it's a good thing check it out it ain't happen it doesn't happen next question if it becomes mandatory in the future 
and if you're, by the way, if you're enmeshed in gambling, there's just like any other addiction through and in Christ and in the church, you can be freed of it. So I just want to encourage you. Don't, don't take my, my comment is like, oh, dismissive of you, God forbid. No, don't get enmeshed in that, but be free of it through the prayers of the saints, through spiritual guidance, through the mysteries, uh, you know, and, and return to a real, a real, um, a life full of diligence, hard work, and and, and peace and righteousness, uh, and not uh, I mean gambling's in the realm of uh, you know not not having honor. It's, it's, it's dishonorable. Uh, so yeah, look it up. You'll find plenty of material showing why gambling's problematic. I hope you I hope you are not enmeshed, and I hope if you are, you can get out of it. If it has becomes mandatory in the future for all people to entwine their consciousness to AI and un, unlift, unlifting, uplifting oneself seems the best option, but is, as we know, forbidden. What should we do? I guess we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. I've never heard of this. I don't even know what you what, what that means to entwine my consciousness to AI. No idea what that means. I mean, you know, I, I can imagine, but I don't know exactly what they're talking about. Why would it become mandatory? I would resist it. I mean, instinctively right now, because I don't really know what you're, what you're referring to in practice. I haven't studied it, but I recoil from it. Like any kind of submission in that way to anybody but God is, I think, anathema, right? Why would I allow that? I would recoil from it and fight that and flee from that because there's something demonic about that. Uh, that's That would be my first reaction. So, wow, Elizabeth, Eliz Elizabeth Pataridu. Okay, how did you write such a big question? And it's because and, I thought there was limitations to those questions, so I'm impressed. So that's the first thing. I think that the catechumens are asked to leave just before the confession of their faith with pistevo, out of, out of love. I don't, I don't know that. That's not in the tradition of the church, to my knowledge. I don't. Maybe that's happening in, in somebody's parish, uh, but that's not. You're thinking of the doors. The doors, I think, is what you're thinking of. That's not the catechumens leaving. The catechumens clearly leave after the gospel. The doors, the doors, were referencing to the church. What we would call it, maybe the church wardens or subdeacons, to make sure the doors for those who were not in the nave to be shut. So only the faithful. So all other people, whether catechumens or those repenting or anybody else who's not going to be communing, that's my understanding. The doors were for that purpose. So, And that's at that late time. That's not the time that you dismiss the catechumens. Traditionally, I'm talking about historically, right? Today, there's, there's very few who practice any of this, unfortunately. I think it's unfortunate. If as a catechumen you are there, you're a part of the people in, a, in church, so you are in a way saying you believe, but actually still in the process of learning what you believe. So I feel that the catechumens would be asked to leave so that they would not say that they believe. Furthermore, if as a catechumen someone would change one's mind, it may be considered as a lie that you act. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, long before that, they, they would depart. Um, but certainly, yeah, there seems to be it's, pre, it's premature, right? It's totally premature for them to be with the faithful and confess the faith when they've not, they've not been initiated. So it doesn't make much sense, even though, even though we, we do it, but we're not making sense by doing it, in my opinion. Should women cover their hair at church? Absolutely. That's a long tradition. All the icons, look around you at every church, all the icons of all the women with maybe one or two exceptions for some particular reason, they all have... Head covering up until very recently, all throughout the world, the Christian world, but certainly around the Orthodox world, it was pretty universally up until World War II it was universally uh, practiced that women covered their heads, not only in church, certainly in church, but in the village that I was in in northern Greece, outside of Thessaloniki, I was told by the old timers that up until the fifties. Women covered their head throughout the day. Anytime they're outside of their house, certainly they were covering their heads. So far more during church. Now, that's what's remained. 
in places like Russia and Romania and everything, there's and not universally in some of those places that women cover their heads while they're in church. That's what's remained. But actually, St. John Chrysostom in his homilies is talking about women covering their heads throughout the day. So that's that's the ancient tradition. Then that's what's remained in our day. So um, as I've said to many times, and I've said to people in my when I was in my parish up in the mountains outside Thessaloniki, I said that if you do this in all humility and modesty, you will experientially understand why it's blessed. It will help you to pray, and you will have the blessing uh, of generation upon generation of many, many saints by imitating the saints, right? We talked about tonight, imitate me, the Apostle Paul says. We imitate Christ. We imitate all of the saints. And certainly women, if, if just in simplicity and love for the saints, if you imitate them in this way, you'll have a blessing. But feminists don't think like that. And generally our world doesn't think like that today. It's all about, you know, rebelling against some perceived yoke. And none of, this, none of them usually have any interest in the spiritual life. So they're never going to understand why this is something that is blessed, right? So it's like talking to the wall. Uh, so just do it. Don't talk about it. Uh, get a blessing if you if you have a spiritual father. Get a blessing, uh, and uh, you know I don't I don't think any spiritual father would say no. Uh, from now, wear it throughout the day. That's pretty bold in this day and age and i think that blessing is important and that's a whole different reality but in the church in many many churches people women are wearing head covering and when they're not they you know it's a good good to begin it's good to begin all right i think that um i think that we have ended i think i've answered all the questions to what i can tell and let me know if there's more 24 questions that I just went through. That's hard. To, oh, no. No, what am I talking about? <laughs> I need to go further down. I thought I ended, thought I ended up. No, I was going to say that didn't seem like 24. All right. We've got uh, another 20 minutes max. Let's see. Next question. I need some water. Father hears. My okay, just so you know, everybody who knows, because I know many people don't know in orthodoxy, we call people priests by their first name, just so you know. So, Father Peter was is how you would probably refer to most priests. But thank you for you know, obviously, you're using my uh, whatever title, or whatever. Uh, my wife is Ethiopian Orthodox. I really want to be true Orthodox, though. I feel like time is short, these are the last days. Please pray I can convince her to convert with me. God bless you. God bless you. Your name? Send me your name if you want us to pray, and we'll try to do that in the, our weak way. Offer up a prayer for you. When St. Isaac of Ninia said, as a handful of sand thrown into the ocean, so are the sins of all flesh as compared with the mind of God. Indeed. Indeed. That gives us great boldness in, in confessing our sins. Great boldness. Thank you. Can you explain how not to take that saying as a free pass to sin? Oh, no, 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 no. He's simply saying that obviously the infinite God compared to our finite sins is incomparable, and therefore we should be emboldened to confess our sins. For God, it is nothing. For us, sins are great things. They obstruct our communion with God. And so on our side of the equation, Sin is a terrible, awful thing that obstructs our communion with God and our purification and our illumination and therefore our true freedom. We should hate sin, absolutely hate sin for depriving us of communion. He's not talking about, God forbid, St. Isaac would be interpreted as saying this is a free pass for sin. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. He's simply talking about on the side of God Take courage because it's nothing for God. And St. John Chrysostom talks about this a lot. And it should not be interpreted anything like a free pass for sin. It's, it's called, in this life, you have very little time to return into full and beautiful communion with God. If you start to play with it and say, well, I can sin and then I can repent later, that's delusional and you may die tomorrow. It's very proud and delusional. Besides, it doesn't have any love. If you really know who Christ is and God is, you want you'll have love for him and you'll not want to sin in the least. 
And when you sin, you'll feel terrible that you you've you've uh, offended him. You've uh, uh, you've turned away from him, and now you're you're not in communion with him, and you'll repent of that. So no, 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 do not interpret it that way. How should men aim to dress? What is true modest? A truly what is truly modest in modern context? If I if I uh, say a fashionable person, how can I avoid vanity? Um, so there is modest and not ugly. Okay, find the royal path. Everything in life is a is a question of there's two extremes. Find the royal path. You can put on clothing that is both modest and attractive or not ugly okay it doesn't have to be attractive in the sense i'm trying to attract people to look at me but it certainly can be done well i mean you know we have vestments as priests we don't want vestments that are all cut wrong and don't look good we want to honor the priesthood honor the lord with beautiful vestments why not having beautiful clothing for human beings and honor the lord with beautiful clothing There's nothing wrong with that but the if with everything in your own, if you're, let's say, somebody who is considered attractive, you have a, a beautiful a symmetrical face and all the rest, right? You can do that with yourself, right? You can, and there's no, you can't really change yourself, can you? So there's, in everything, you can do that, right? You can do that with, if you have a, a gift of speaking, or if you have a gift of painting, you can become enamored with that and be proud and arrogant. So in everything, the there's a royal path that we we want to honor the human person we want to honor the the, the day of the lord uh, we want to do something that's going to be beautiful we beautiful there's a beautiful beautiful things in life we love beauty in the orthodox churches our churches are very beautiful we love that we don't want ugly things in the church right so it's okay to be beautiful it's okay to, to, to put beautiful clothing on but you're going to stay on this royal path not go to extremes you're not going to spend a billion dollars uh you're not going to uh, walk around like a peacock and think you're the best. I mean, all of that, you're, you're going to fight against all that in your thoughts. And if you are excessively bogged down because you can't get beyond that and you, you, you've given, you're giving rights to the enemy with your thought, you know, and you're, oh my gosh, I'm so, this is so bad. I have the best clothing. Nobody looks like me. I mean, if you have these kind of thoughts, then you should probably tone it down, simplify it, undercut it, right? So it depends on the person as well, how they're going to deal with that. There are some people who walk around, they don't even think about it. They could care less. They never crosses their mind what clothing they have on. But they also understand what it means to have nice clothing. They put it on. And that's the last thing they think about it. So there's a law, a big spectrum. It's a big spectrum of people, right, that are having uh, from, from thinking about it and being totally indifferent to it to being enslaved to it. That doesn't change the fact that something's, it's objectively good to have something beautiful. Or, or 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 appropriate or or symmetrical you know <laughs> that's perfectly fine i think that the spiritual life is such that we are going to constantly be fighting with all kinds of areas the same struggle to be you know in the world but not of it to to have something that's beautiful but not be obsessed with it not be a uh, um uh, enslaved to it you know um so it's this this balancing act in the spiritual life but simple 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 heretical per se. I mean, there are all kinds of people. I listen to people that are not Orthodox, but I'm not going to sit in a Roman Catholic slash papal Protestant or Reformed Protestant and and say, oh, I need to learn from them, you know, the life of the church or the light or the dogmas of the church. Or that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right? Do you go to people that you know are in error? Uh, and don't teach, you know, let's say you're in a class of political science or you're in uh, geometry and you know that the teachers are, don't know what they're talking about. And you're going to go and sit at their feet and say, can you teach me the thing you do? I know you don't know what you're talking about. So if, if you're reading heterodox sources to learn the Christian faith from them, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, are there things that they're doing that are not really essential or kind of peripheral versus pro-life work? Not a lot of there's a lot of people in the heterodox communities, Roman Catholic, Protestant, who are very involved in pro-life work, and uh, there could be people you, you know your go-to people if you want to learn about that topic, for instance. That's probably not problematic, but as far as the life in Christ, the spiritual life, the hesychastic, ascetic life, no, you go to Orthodox sources. As far as the dogmas of the Church, the teachers of the faith, you go to Orthodox sources. 
Um, so do, do you see the distinction? Like there's certain things that are for in the inner life of the church. We learn them from the saints. We learn them from the teachers of the faith and only there. And then there's other things that are more, you know, non-essential, social, communal, political, historical. Yeah, you can learn a lot of things from a lot of people in that area. But you still got to be on guard, right? You still got to be careful uh, that you're not, uh, you're not, you know, you still, you still got to be struggling to be watchful and to have the orthodox strong enough. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for your question. Do you have advice on baptizing toddlers who are terrified to put their face under water? I've tried practicing with them to no avail. They are four and three years old. Ooh, you waited way too long, but maybe you weren't orthodox, so it's fine. But if you, when you wait too long, generally speaking to orthodox parents, baptize your children as soon as possible in the first 60 days. After the 40 day, the, and the mother can come to church, baptize the child. That's the ideal. We just had five baptisms here, five different babies in this community, all, all within, I think it was from between you know, 40 and 60 days after their birth. Now, having said that, you have four and three year olds. Maybe for some reason there was no way to baptize them. You weren't Orthodox, whatever. I understand. What are we going to do? I think the best thing is to, to talk to the priest, get them to feel very comfortable with the priest. At this age, the older age, right? That's number one. Number two, um, I don't think it's so much you can like train them with the water. Maybe, maybe that'll help. You can keep trying, but I think the priest needs to do the baptism in in some place that's very, very large, like a river, and don't try to baptize the children in anything small. That's a bad idea. That's not going to go well, and you're not going to have a, a proper baptism, and that's not good. That's not good. He needs to properly immerse the children three times. That's what the Christ, the apostles, and the fathers have taught for 2,000 years. That's the Orthodox baptism. That's what we talk, That's what we mean by baptism. So it's really key that they know the priest, and the priest prepares properly to do a baptism for this age group, which would mean in a very large tub or pool or a, very, or a river or, I don't know, a large body of water so that there's no possibility that they're going to like put their legs out or their arms out and 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 make it very difficult for the priest to immerse them um and then i would if possible these are you know i don't know if this is possible but just you asked me so i'm trying to think of different ways to make it go well if possible that place that will the baptism will take place if they were able to go there and spend time and get and get acclimated that would also help perhaps but it has to be the same place where the baptism is going to take place the person and the place those are just human things. Then you need to pray. You need to pray. He needs to pray. You need to trust God. And you need to desire to do exactly what God teaches. The exactitude, the akrivia of what God wants. If you desire that and you pray for it and you take steps to do it, I think God's going to help you. I think that your patron saints of these children are going to help you. And I'd love to hear back from you after you go through the whole process. Alexander, another question. I've been homeless for a few years and I've been struggling with, with seeing myself as worthy of love, but I freely give it. Am I in a bad direction? Uh, no, you're in a good direction, uh, but God loves you. And so that when you struggle to say that I'm worthy of love, you're doubting God's love and that's not good for you. You're actually, the problem here is not, is that you've been probably, I don't, I don't know you, but I mean, this is what's very common today is that we have been abused in one way or another by the world. Uh, maybe even by parents or relatives or whatever, right? So we've been, we've been, the trust has been burned, right? So we're now struggling to trust again. And that's the whole, that's the whole process of going deeper into the faith is that you have to trust and trust is difficult. That's the key though, to going deeper in the spiritual life. So you are now struggling with this trust question and that's the key. You've got to go back again and again and know Christ and the saints in the scriptures, in the writings, in the lives of the saints. And you, if you bathe yourself spiritually in that, right, you will you will grow in trust. And that trust will wipe away this feeling of not being worthy because of whatever has happened to you in the past or whatever people say about you or whatever it is, right? Whatever failures you've had, all that, all that is so limited and so human, right? You've got to get beyond that. All of us have to get beyond that. And realize we have a loving God who died for us. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing 
from his perspective about you that is unworthy of love. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you immensely. He died for you, and he's calling you to be in communion with him. Do not doubt that he loves you a hundred and zillion percentages. That's beyond your imagination. That's how our loving God is. So trust him. Grow in that, and you'll start to you'll start to see how quickly you're going to ascend in the spiritual life. That's the key. That's the that's the heart of the spiritual life. Entirely trusting our life to Christ, having coming to know his loving providence and 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 care for us. If you, you go on and you say, if I can't see myself in the light that those around me see me, am I condemning myself? Um, it doesn't matter what how they see you. I don't know why that's an issue. Don't make that an issue. How I don't know what you, why would we sit around and what do they think of me? What do they think of me? I don't who cares? What does God think of you? What does your spiritual father say? Do you have a spiritual father? Is he is he guiding you in the spiritual life? Really essential stuff. Basic one-on-one orthodoxy. We have a guide. You want to become anything in this life, you've got to have a guide. Right? How much more for the spiritual life? How much more for the eternal life? We need guides. It's very, very important. We have a good guide. And then we go back again and again. And that person initiates us into the mystery of Christ. So that person and God, and if you were married, I would say your wife. Those are the people who you should care what they say. Maybe your children as well. But if you are looking to so-and-so and so-and-so who are not your spiritual fathers, not your wife, not your children, not your mother and father, you know, the people who, who God has given to you and you know, ideally to guide you, those are the ones we should care. Everybody else doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what they say. They might help us though. They might love us and, and we should listen. I'm just saying we shouldn't like depend upon them. Like, well, they, do they love me? Do they accept me? That kind of thing. Uh, that's not that's not how we should live. Uh, but do we have friends who want to help us and we should listen? Absolutely. A humble person is going to listen to everybody and get and grow quickly. How would you advise someone dealing with gluttony? It feels like the whole society prompts us to eat too much and this sin is rarely addressed. That is absolutely true. Uh, and that is a major problem in the world today. Um, we are we have so much at our fingertips always in abundance. But don't worry because it's not going to last forever. In fact, the days are coming when we're all going to be faced with some level of uh, of limitation on how how easily we access food, a crisis is coming. A if not starvation, it's going to be a time of you know um, severe limitations put on all these things, and people are going to suffer because they're so so badly. Uh, what's the word? Spoiled. And they're gonna they're gonna struggle through this. Uh, so um, let's start right now learning how to live with less. Let's start right now fasting more. Let's start right now not only for this immediate what seems to be on the horizon crisis, which God allows for our own benefit and for our own salvation, but for eternity, right? So there's what's missing in your life and in every addiction and every passion. What's missing? Fear of God, hatred of sin, love of Christ and his will for us. That's what's always missing. Why are we beset by this passion or that passion, this addiction or that addiction? Because that is above Christ. That is our master. We have given rights to it. We've, we've, we've worshipped at it, right? So now we have to hate it. We have to turn and spit on it, figuratively, of course. We have to turn to Christ. We have to reorient ourselves to Christ and, and call out to him and beg him and, and, and implore him to free us now from this tyrant, this tyrant, this passion, this addiction that we've given rights to. And he will free us. But we have to be patient. It's a process. How many years or months have you been a slave? That's how many, possibly, how many years or months you will take to be totally free of that. So I'm not saying it's mathematical. I'm saying that we have to be prepared for that. We have to have that much patience, right? We've indulged ourselves for eight months, a year, six months, whatever. We should not think that in two days for six days or six, 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 60 days, we should be free. Oh, I'm, I can't deal with it. I gotta, I'm going to go back to the passion. Wait a minute. You indulged yourself for this long, but you expect to be free of it in this short time. Not even in the world do people talk like that. Go to the people who, who try to help people to lose weight. They're going to tell you, patience. 
intermittent fasting, you know, all that on the physical level, how much more <clears throat> on the spiritual level. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I would say to you is <clears throat> one of the big reasons why we end up falling into sin is because we are, uh, we have the occasion to sin. What does that mean? We're around it. So you're around the food. That's why you're eating it. If you're not around food, you won't eat it as much. That's simple. So what can you do to make it far away from you? Lock it up. Don't have access to it. Force yourself into this new habit. Force yourself into this new way of living. It's not going to come easy. You've got to you've got to devise ways that you will trick yourself or force yourself or or or, or exclude yourself from that way of life that you were leading before that habit, that habitual way. You've got to you got to realize I don't trust yourself, right? You will eat. You will drink. It's going to happen. Okay, so therefore I know that about myself. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to cut it off. I'm not going to allow the occasion for it, all right? So that's how we're going to have to work on that passion and all the passions. And then the most important for last, you need to pray. If you want to be free spiritually forever from the passion, you've got to beg God. I think I already said that, but it bears repeating. He's wearing makeup to church a problem. Well, wearing makeup generally is a problem. Why do we wear makeup? Think about it. Think about it. Now, there are some extent, very, there's always, people always say, well, I have this, I have that, I have this severe acne. Okay, there are extreme cases. All right, but we're talking about the normal case of a person whose face is not, you know, some extreme problem. It's just that they want to look better. Right? I'm putting makeup on to make myself more attractive, more, uh, you know, appealing. All right. So right there, if we examine that, we actually see that the base of that is vain glory. Right. God made you beautiful. You're in his image. There's nothing more beautiful than God and his image. And you're in that image, no matter what they say, no matter your physique or you're in the image of God because the image of God is not that superficial. It's not just your skin or your hair. The image of God is deep throughout your whole being. So you are beautiful because you're made in the image of God. Now, if you're in a baptized, chrismated, orthodox Christian communion, that image has been totally washed and purified, and it's been established, and now you're on the process of going to the likeness, which is imitating and being in, full of the virtues, right? So you not only were you made in the image, now you've been restored to the image. So going now and putting makeup is absolutely absurd. It's absolutely just like absurd if we understand who we are and what we've been doing. And so you're going to improve now on this beautified, restored image. You're going to make it better. No, you're not. You're going to make it worse. Actually, makeup makes you look worse. According to Christ and the saints, according to the world, of course, it makes you look better. And people are expecting that in the world. Okay. If you want to live according to the world, go ahead. Wear the makeup. When you go to church, what are you doing there? Why are you going? For the world or for Christ? So in the eyes of the saints, makeup is ugly. In the eyes of God, it's absurd. Why would we need any of that? None of that is necessary. You may say, you may say Father, you were telling me to wear nice clothes to church and put on nice clothes. Yeah, clothing is not... The body, you're not altering the body. You're not putting things on the on the, your skin and trying to alter it and make it look more this and more that. You're just you're just adorning it in respect for it. This is different. This is different. And this is vainglory. And the, the clothing could be vainglory as well, depending on how you do it. I agree with that. That's true. But makeup is a is a one step beyond because it goes directly on the face. And so here's the thing. Try to see if you can't stop. You just oh, I gotta have makeup. Gotta have makeup. You become it's gonna become a habit. It's come away. You feel naked if you go out. Okay, that's gonna take a process to be free to that. But that alone tells you that this is not right. Like the fact that you're like enslaved to it and you don't you don't you go, oh I can't get rid of that makeup because I just don't feel like I gotta have the makeup. That it shows you that mm, something's not right. I'm actually not at peace. I'm actually not good with, you know, who I am in God's eyes, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, the short answer is yes, don't wear makeup and don't wear it to church for sure.
Question. <clears throat> have you ever been, have you ever evangelized an Ethiopian Orthodox into converting? Well, first of all, as I said in one of the shorts recently, somebody asked me, should I try to convert my Protestant? I said, no, not in that way. So we don't go, I don't go like to, let's say I got somebody here next to me down the street. Uh, Jim, we'll call him Jim. Hey, Jim, how you doing, Jim? Jim, you really need to be Orthodox. Hey, Jim, you know, come to church with me. You need to be with me. And that kind of an overarching pushiness is not the Orthodox way. All right. So now, is somebody interested in Orthodoxy? Is somebody interested in learning about it? And they want to talk to me? Absolutely. I'll sit with them for hours if, if need be. Is, do, can I help in any way? Can I clarify something? Can I, you want me to pray for somebody? Absolutely. Somebody wants to come and ask you a question, you want to answer it? Absolutely. Be prepared to answer. You've got to be prepared to answer. And you better know your faith because that's your responsibility to know how to give an answer on you know the basic tenets of the faith. But generally what we say to people is what they say in the gospel. Come and see. Come and see. The divine liturgy is the center of the church, the life of eternity. It's the beginning of eternity. It's where we touch eternity, right? Come and see Christ. Don't stay the whole divine liturgy. Come and see, hear the gospel and leave. But come and see in your for what's appropriate for you at your place and your, your stage of, of coming closer to Christ. That's how that's done. You offer it. They don't want it. You can't force it. There's no forcing. There's no Christ says, anyone who wants to be my disciple, come after me, follow after me. That's how it is. And prayer and love and self-sacrifice and a good word and patience, that's what you got to offer for your wife. Um, the question is really personal. Uh, you, the rest of your question is, how do you broach the subject to my wife who is an about Ethiopian Orthodox woman? Look, is she interested in learning more about Orthodoxy? That's how you do that. Would you like to learn more? I know a priest or I know a catechist or I know some videos you should watch or a book you should read. That's how you do it. Does she want? Okay, here. And we can help. There's a reading list on theorthodoxethos.com. There's really great books. I think you need, they need, women usually are not going to interested in church history or dogmatics. Okay. That's not usually what women are interested in. What are they in? They're interested in beauty. They're interested in peace and the raising their children and things like this. They're interested in that which is immediately real and practical to their life. So books, if you're going to give a book, it would be something that's really ex exposed them to the core of the spiritual life and the depth and beauty of the spiritual life. And that's why many times I like to give people who aren't really ready or interested the way of the pilgrim, the way of a pilgrim. It's a beautiful, wonderful story, easy read, intriguing, uh, and uh, not big, not long. Something like that would be good. The spiritual life. I think in your case, I'd recommend that. Father, I decide to begin my conversion to Eastern Orthodoxy today. God bless you, Kevin Wiseman. God bless you. God keep you. God give you illumination, good struggles, patience, love. Everybody pray, say a prayer for Kevin. You and your ch channel has been huge in helping me make that decision. God bless you. That's really wonderful to hear. Do you have any advice for someone just starting a path? I just kind of gave it <laughs> the previous question. Come and see. Come and see. Stay until the gospel. Come back again. Slowly get to know people in the community. Slowly begin to read. It, it, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's different places. I would have to know you more to tell you what to read. If you told me, well, I'm interested in this, this, and this, and I've read that and that, I would say, okay, well, then read this. I don't, I mean, I can throw all kinds of books at you. That's easy. That's the easiest thing. We publish books. I mean, go look at our publishings. But it's about experiencing Christ. It's about going deeper in the spiritual life um, and deciding, you know, if you understand orthodoxy as the one holy Catholic Absolute Church, you understand, you recognize this is the church that Christ founded is coming down to us with all the problems that we have, with all of our own sins. I'm a donkey. I mean, you got to sit here and listen to a donkey all the time. I mean, that's some, it's, it's what we are. Unfortunate. Unfortunate, but yet, in spite of it all, Christ still is all in all and shining forth. And so I would say um, that's the most important. Now, there's tons of books. Go to our reading list. There's tons of really important books, depending on what you're interested in, what you, you know, you might still, ah, I really hung up on this, you know, I don't know what, whatever, the papal infallibility or, or whatever it is that you're coming from. Okay, well then we'll deal with that and then talk about that. But ultimately, 
come and see is the answer for all everybody. We've got to go and we've got to experience. We've got to start to pray and start to go deeper. Does a hoodie count as a head covering for women? <laughs> Only in America would somebody ask me, does a hoodie count? Well, then again, now all over the world we have American culture. You know, I guess, I guess, sure, okay. But then eventually you're going to, if you do it enough, you're going to say, this is kind of goofy. Nobody's wearing a hoodie like me. I'll get an actual head covering, but whatever. Better to have a head covering, but if if the, if, you, if the hoodie's all you got, then we'll take it. <laughs> How should Christians interact with the dogmas taught in academia? Say, if I'm being against certain sinful aspects of modern theology, would one have would one have reprimanded? I'm trying to figure this one out. Certain aspects. Um, I don't really understand the question very well, but I'm, I mean, do you need to abandon sinful aspects of, aspects of modern ideology? Yes, I would try to abandon those. They're not going to be conducive to a spiritual life. I don't know exactly what you're what you're referring to, but if it's sinful aspects, then we should abandon those. Um, dogmas taught in academia. What does that mean? I mean, dogmas, is it, are they orthodox dogmas? Are they heterodox dogmas? Um. I guess you mean non-Christian dogmas. How should we interact with them? You know, if you've got that gift and you love and study and all the rest, then sure. If you've got that gift, you got a blessing from a spiritual father, you're going to interact and try to, you know, bring light to that area. Okay. But generally speaking, the Orthodox and the church has never had some kind of, you know, we've got to engage with all these dogmas and all these uh, ideologies. Uh, I think it's a, it can become a trap. And become a trap. Um, it, Christ says, "Whoever wants to be my disciple," and we say, "Come and see." And so we're not going to, you know, we'll in the in the realm of ideas, we'll we'll state the orthodox position. And if you like it, fine. If you don't, that's fine too. Whatever you're free. I think that's the orthodox approach. All right, we're running out of time, and the questions keep coming. We're going to have to stop questions, Justin. No more questions because I'm not going to answer all these, and I don't want people to, you know, spend their time asking questions I can't answer. Father, how do you overcome akidia? Akidia is the way we say it in Greek, asidia. Um, are there any practical things you would advise that we can implement to rid ourselves from this sin? So slothfulness or like just being being um, uh, debilitated by this, by this uh, laziness, this slothfulness. Uh, you know, positive and negative. You, you know, you need positive and you need negative. You need inspiration. And you need the fear of God put in you. You know, in pedagogy, classical pedagogy, and good spiritual pedagogy, there's there's both honey and the stick, right? There's both, uh, you know, the the canona, as we say in Greek, the the, the spiritual canon where you got to go do you know fifty prostrations, and then there's the uh, you know beautiful uh, experience that you had at vigil, and the grace of God was flowing, and then you were inspired. You know, you need both. Both and, right? So if you want to overcome this, that's a terrible sin. It's, it just debilitates you. It's like it's like an atomic bomb, you know, because it just it just obliterates the spiritual life. So you've got to use everything in your power, and you've got to be inspired. So are you reading the lives of the saints? Are you reading the contemporary lives of the saints? Are you reading these great ascetics that live in our day and being inspired by them? If you're not, you're missing out a big tool, big a big gun against the Akivia. Are you visiting monasteries? Are you meeting with people who are struggling? Do you have examples of people struggling? Another big miss if you don't. Do you do you force yourself at least a little bit? Are you doing prostrations? Are you are you fasting until 12 or 3 or whatever you're doing? What are you doing to create habits of ascetic habitual ascetic life, the way we you know our day? Are you are you strict with your program? Your your are you strict with your time? All these things go into it, right? And do you have a spiritual father? How often do you go to confession? I mean, there's tons of things here that with all the passions, but especially uh, this great evil that are going to be at work for you to be free from the sickness. You need all of it. You need a spiritual father. And you need a spiritual guide. And you got to take advantage of positive and negative pushing and pulling and inspiring.
Your blessing, is this a good analogy to regard the chaotic humans departing? We wouldn't go sit in a PhD level class when we're in freshman in college. Exactly. Right. In the world, we do this all the time. You can't, you can't get into a class if you haven't done the prerequisites in college. You can't, a freshman in college, unless he's done the prerequisites already in honors or whatever in high school, can't go to a third or four level uh, lecture, at least traditionally. I don't know. Nowadays, everything's chaos, but that's how it works, right? And it wouldn't make any sense. So, let's take this. Listen, it's, you know what? It's not even college. It go, it's like going to a sixth grader, a fifth grader, a third grader. Come on, we're going to go and sit at a high school or a college level. It doesn't make any sense. This is the same in the spiritual life. There's a whole hierarchy. We talked about hierarchy. Today. There's a whole hierarchy. And you got to respect it if you're going to make progress. First things first. Question, I feel no connection to God. It might be because I don't have a good re reasons for orthodoxy, especially. What should I do? How are you going to connect to God? God became man. God became man and dwelt among us. And he is present in his body, the church, in his words, I mean, through the scriptures, through the lives of the saints, through the whole experience of the spiritual life in the church, through a spiritual father, uh, through um, all kinds of ways that the, the gospel is communicated in the world today. What are you doing to fill your life with these ins inspirational things? And therefore, grow in trust, at least of the saints. You say you can't trust God. You don't know connection. That means you can't trust him ultimately. If you were, if you knew him, you'd be drawn to him, right? If you trusted him, you would have a relationship with him. That's how things work. So you don't, you don't have a connection. You really don't know him yet. You haven't met him. Or if you've met him, you've not understood him. Or if you've understood him, you haven't yet entered into communion with him. And so that has to happen in a time and space in a place right it's not we don't we're not disembodied gnostic you know we're not we have a flesh we have flesh and we have communion with other human beings so what are you doing to fill your life with those things that are going to inspire you to trust god and then the saints and then be inspired by them and have them as your guides that's the question you got to answer eo means eastern orthodox Eastern Orthodox. It's just a way to say the Orthodox Church. Um, maybe to differentiate from the Oriental, so-called Oriental Orthodox. What regards should we hold Western Orthodoxy for doing sprinkling baptism? Absolutely anathema. No reason for sprinkling baptisms. There's no basis. There's no basis. Look, get our book. It's right here. Let me show it. Put it on the screen. Anybody who wants to know the truth of things, right there. Oh, not that one. Not that one. Here we go. 450 pages, lays it out. Sprinkling especially is not, not blessed unless there's an extreme need like somebody's on a deathbed. I've said this incessantly forever, it seems like. Can't believe people in the Orthodox Church would actually do that. Don't know what to say. Don't know what to say. All right, thanks for answering my question, Father. I, no, I'm not reading or visiting them. May I may just stumble upon an interesting topic online or just nice words or saying not so much for teacher. All right. Thanks, Dylan. Are there any living saints today on the caliber of Elder of Family Arizona or St. Paisios? Uh, it's hard to say um, because oftentimes during their lives, people don't really understand who they are. Like St. Paisios was exceptional. People really understood toward the end of his life that he was this amazing saint. But there are others who we don't really realize. Most people don't realize. So they're kind of hidden. And I think in our the, na the nature of our day today is that they're going to be hidden. Because we don't have the criteria, and the world is so insane, and it's going to be harder and harder for us to see them and interact with them because, because of the dynamics, which I can't get into tonight, right now. So I would say, yes, they exist, but they're hidden for the most part. But the few that I, I could say are not hidden and are well-known, that I would say are following, they're following the saints. I'm not going to be so bold to say that they are just like them, because no saint is really like another saint. But they're following them and they're faithful to them. I mean, certainly this Kili, that's why we're doing the book, Elder of Themios, who wrote the book. I mean, I don't know if he wrote the book, but the, it's from the Kili. And he's the elder of the Kili, the cell on Manathos. The elder of Themios is a disciple of St. Paisios, and he's following in his footsteps. Elder Parthenios of St. Paul's Monastery, a great elder and revered on Manathos. Just two names that come to mind, but there are many others on Athos in my experience, and in the monasteries. But a lot of times, like I said, they're hidden because we don't have 
the presuppositions to to understand them and to hold them in into and for them to also maybe in this day and age if to be exposed to this reality would be very disruptive the way things are all right we just signed off over at orthodox ethos that's my bell to say you got to stop three hours is my max so i'm going to do a really quick like bullet answering for the next couple of questions then we're going to we're going to hang up i don't know if i missed anybody over at crowdcast yes there's three more questions of crowdcast oh i owe you these answers here maria father bless i was talking with some of my friends the other day we were all wondering during the time of the antichrist can the people that don't have the mark work for the people that have it and get paid by them thank you i don't know the answer for sure but my guess is yes there will be people in the system who will work with them outside the system it'll be like here in the soviet period It'll be like during the Nazi period. I don't know. There'll be there'll be a totalitarian government, but there'll still be people who, even though they're in it, are not serving it. You know, they're they're under the power of it, but they're not like demon possessed or something. Uh, certainly, God will, be, will take care of us in many unbelievable ways. That's what's promised. Uh, so we don't need to really worry about that right now. It's kind of speculative. Let's just focus right now what we got in front of us how do we overcome spiritual laziness how do we get god's attention through prayer so i just answered that i just answered that um about akidia asidia look at that question two questions ago father bless is there a canonical orthodox jurisdiction that is old calendar and does byzantine chant i'm looking for an alternative to goc or oh, aristotle Rivera. um so it's here and there it's here and there antiochians use byzantine chant they're not on the old calendar um old calendar jurisdictions let's go through them so church patriarchate of jerusalem patriarchate of russia patriarchate of serbia patriarchate of georgia um well mount athos uh what am i missing rocor of course in the in the west uh so in america byzantine chant there are a few rocor parishes that do byzantine chant but very rare um and then uh no byzantine chant almost all the churches in the mediterranean that use byzantine chant with the exception of the patriarchate of jerusalem are on the new calendar so there is no oh there is a jerusalem patriarchate there are a few parishes in jerusalem patriarchate but i don't know if they're using the old calendar or not look up that the jerusalem patriarchate depending where you are i don't know where you're living the Jerusalem Patriarchate in America, which is now in the Greek Archdiocese, but they might still use the old calendar, depending on where you There's not that many parishes, though. Okay, that's enough there. I think I've answered those. And then we're back here. Um, Metropolitan Silouan, Silouan says that those who are baptized are, oh, oh up, in the, up in the UK. Um, so I don't know what to say to that, except that his the elder, all I know is this. And I'm not going to go further because we don't have time. Elder Parthenios, Elder Parthenios, the one I just mentioned, who's a great elder, who Saint Paisius said he. There are many abbots. There's only one Parthenios. All right, so he revered Parthenios, uh, and I and I personally revere him, and he baptized me. So I'm very grateful to God for Elder Parthenios. He's the spiritual father of the patriarch of the patriarch of Antioch. He's the spiritual father. He is the publisher of I Confess One Baptism. That monastery published I Confess One Baptism, okay? And it's well known to baptize people after they've been chrismated. That's a well-known thing. All the bishops in the patriarchate know that. All the, bish all the bishops around the world know that. It's like everybody knows this, right? So so I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, except what do you do? Are we going to excommunicate Elder Prothenius, the spiritual father of the patriarch of Antioch? Should we do that? Should we excommunicate him? God help us. Do we fast olive oil on Wednesdays and Fridays? Absolutely. That's the that's I shouldn't say absolutely. That's what I understand. Now I know there are some Orthodox who don't. I don't understand what they're doing exactly. I don't understand the reasoning, but I know that, that they're doing that. But my understanding in Greece, I'm on Athos, and in most parts of the Orthodox Church, from my experience, it's just my experience. I don't know. They do fast from oil, and it's I mean. In the calendar, it says this is an oil day, which means normally it's not, right? That we have Wednesday and Friday, and then we have a feast day. On the, and so, oh, and for the feast day, we eat oil, which means we don't normally eat oil. That's what the calendar says. So 
I don't understand the whole mix up there. There's some who don't, and I don't. I am not responsible for that, and I don't know what to say. Does faith come before fear of God? Fear of God is the root of all wisdom, but faith, when we're talking about it as trust, right, is the foundation of the entire spiritual life. So are you going to, fear does not mean to be afraid, it's to be honor and respect and hold in awe, right? So are you going to honor, respect, and hold in awe someone, God, who you do not trust, who you do not believe in, who you do not experience his providence and therefore trust him and, you know, experientially? I think they go together. I think the order of things would be uh, to know God is to love him, to know God is to trust him. And then, of course, having this relationship, you're going to have him in great awe, respect. Admiration. So, what is your opinion of former Vladika Artemi of Serbia? I love Father Bishop Artemi. I love his witness. I love his writings. The only thing that I stumble on is his ordination uh, alone of other bishops. Other, otherwise, I think he was a holy man and did amazing. It was amazing. Um, it's tragic what happened. Uh, I believe that the, that he will be, at a future ecumenical council, he will be justified. Humanism will be condemned. And all of this will come to an end. It's a temporary thing. That's my prayer, and that's my belief that uh, that, that will happen. In the meantime, the situation is a mess. That's all I can say. And, that, and I'm not judging it at all. I'm just saying it's a mess. I don't know what to do. Uh, but uh, absolutely, um, we published uh, years ago his writings in Divine Ascent. One of the first uh, things we published was his write, his text on marriage from a dogmatic perspective. He was a great disciple of St. Eusti Bobovich. I know there were differences between him and uh, Athanasi, him and Amphilochi. I know they didn't like certain things. I don't know. I'm not, I wasn't in Serbia. I can't speak to that. But my experience, he's admirable are there any living saints in the church like saint paisus and saint Ephraim in arizona i think i answered that already i mentioned two on mount athos but there are many more go to the monasteries and you will find them usually in the monasteries sometimes not sometimes not i mean the ones that become known to us you know in this life because they're spiritual fathers and became known to us two questions and we're out this is it i'm i'm also about the to run out of steam. I've converted to orthodoxy by the help of my dad, but my mother is Roman Catholic and won't let me go to church with my dad. What advice could you give me? Tell your father to put his foot down. That's what I would tell you. And tell her to stop and let, her, let you be free. What is that? That's, no, Christians don't do that. They don't force people to be, in, you know, force people into a Christian life. That doesn't seem right. So. Pray, ask your father to put his foot down, tell, tell your mother uh, that what you're doing is not Christian. Let me be. Father, I suffered from drug addictions and several severe sexual immorality about 12, 12 weeks ago. I renounced all of it. Glory to God in the highest. I had a dream that God had a mission for me, and then I found the Orthodox Church. Look at that. Thank you so much. Moises, is that how we're going to say that name? Moises, Mo, Mo, Mises, I don't know. You could pronounce it different ways, but very nice Thank you very much for sharing that, and that's a wonderful thing. If you want to write to us at team at orthodoxethos.com more, if you have more to tell us, we'd love to hear, team at orthodoxethos.com. And I'm very grateful to God, um, and let me know if we can be of assistance. I hope you go deep. Don't ever give up. Patience to the end. And, uh, yeah, good struggles. You're going to have struggles ahead. It's going to take time. Don't worry. The struggle is good. The struggle itself is salvation. Don't expect anything else. Just struggle. Go deep in the struggle, which is love. Right? If you struggle, you love. And if you love, you're in a good place. So don't worry about it. But if you have suffered from these things, you will have a process, just like anything else. It's a process to get to the other side. 
So good patience. God bless you. That's it for tonight. Say a prayer for us all. We'll see you now. I still don't know when we're coming back. I need Justin to tell me. When are we coming back? Tell me right now. I, we have a strange schedule this week. Usually it's Tuesdays and Thursdays. What's our next live stream? Justin? Justin? Friday. What am I doing on Friday? Q&A. Okay. Friday Q&A. <laughs> I got to We're getting. It's out. It's crazy. We're get. We got so much going on. Friday Q and A five. Uh, let's see, five Pacific, eight Eastern time. See you then. God bless. God help us through the prayers of our holy fathers. <laughs> Amen.